Thanks for all the hearts. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to this week's live stream. Uh, we do one every Saturday at 2.08-ish p.m. Central Time. And uh, today's topic is gonna be about uh, dipping corals and why that's so important. And also some very important things to keep in, well, I've said important twice. I hate reusing a sentence, a word in a sentence like that. However, we definitely wanna stay on top of these things to avoid running into issues later. And when you buy a new coral or you get a coral from a friend, there's still a risk that you should dip it and protect your lives, your, the rest of your reef from an infestation. <clears throat> now there are all kinds of pests and some are more benign and some are worse. And depending on what you let slip into your reef will be how much work it will be later to solve that problem. One of the uh, things I like to do is dip it in something like, uh, I use this giant bottle called The Dip. Um, to be honest, I got this thing as a, uh, let's just call it a gift. I was at Magna, they just handed it to me and said, try it out. And I was sure this would come to market, and then it just kind of didn't, and then it did, and it's like nobody knows about it. But it's from Fauna Marin, so it probably does exist, and you probably can get it, and it's very strong. <clears throat> and uh, it replaces something that I used from them many, many years ago that was in a little tiny glass vial, the kind that women would get as a sample of perfume. And they could take off the, the cap and put a drop on their wrist and on their other wrist, and that would be the smell. Well, this coral dip came in that little vial and I got like two or three samples and it was fantastic. I loved it. And then I could never get any of it ever again. And then when I was at the Fauna Marin facility, um, they said, oh yeah, absolutely, here you go. And I got me this giant bottle. So um, if you are looking for a coral dip, I like this one a lot. Another one that I recommend and sell on my website is called Revive from Two Little Fishies, which is a softer coral cleaner. It's not a harsh dip. And I know there's lots of other things you can use. Uh, some people like to use the product from Home Depot or Lowe's that, um, uh, why can't I think of its name? Anyway, um, they use that and when they mix it with the water it becomes milky white and they can't see through it, which is sort of a downside to me because I wanna see the coral while it's being dipped. So let's uh, just deal with the how this plays out. You get a opportunity to go to a fish store that you didn't expect you see something you didn't plan to buy, you rush home with it, and you still have to go to work, or you have the kids, or you have to cook dinner or whatever, and you have this brand new frag, what do you do with it? <clears throat> Some people might say, I've never had a problem before, I'll just put this frag in my tank. Others might say, no, absolutely not, I'm gonna leave it in the bag. Um, others might say, I've got a quarantine tank set up to put new frags in immediately, so I don't have to sweat it. And that was actually my method back in the day. I had a 14 gallon cube in the fish room and it was always running 24 seven. It had a dedicated stack of live rock in there that would never be removed to put in the system because of the different products I used in that tank alone. And whatever I came home with, whether it was zoanthids or gorgonians or acropora or fungia or whatever it was, went into that tank. That way it was acclimated, it was in the system and I could deal with whatever was going on later. However, um, when I rebuilt the room for this, I never got around to setting up the permanent quarantine tank. I just didn't allocate the space to it, and I don't have that feature. So like you, I come home with a brand new coral, I have to do something with it immediately. Now what I would recommend is float the coral immediately in your system somewhere. It can float in the display, it can float in the sump, but do not forget about your frag. That is one of the worst things you can do is nine hours later you look down, or the next day, and you're like, where? Oh my God, I've left this in here overnight in that bag with like this much water. Anyway. 15, 20 minutes is usually all it takes to, to match the temperature. Salinity should be close to your tank anyway because it's a coral, and corals tend to be in higher salinity water, which are, we run a reef at, so normally you don't have to worry about salinity acclimation. It's more of a temperature. <clears throat> then you want to have one or two buckets. So like I have two buckets right here, a small one that is basically one gallon, and then a larger one, which is two gallons. But you could use two identical ones if you wanted. Um, here's the smaller one. And uh, you want to put in the right amount of tank water into the bucket with the right amount of the dip. Once you've chosen the, the uh, you know, like for example, if I was using the dip, I would read the instructions again because I never memorize anything forever because <laughs> I know the information's on the bottle. And it'll say this many drops or this many milliliters you know, per this many gallons. And I will make my solution, stir it up. And one of my methods is when the water is inside the bucket, is I will stir it with my turkey baster or even pump the turkey baster a few times to make sure it's completely mixed before I put the frags in. Once the frag is in here, or let's say frags, 
because that's really an important part of this conversation. Once the frags are in that bucket, start a timer immediately. And if the dip says on the bottle 10 minutes, don't go 20, don't go 30, don't go 40. Um, you want to be in there the right duration. If it's um, the stuff from Home Depot, which the name still eludes me. I don't know, somebody might have said it here on YouTube. I don't know if I'm going to get lucky or not. I don't see it. You know, two days ago, I had a ladybug land on me, and I heard that was lucky, and I've been needing some luck. Bear, thank you. See, my luck is working out. So the bear product, uh, people will make that solution, and they put the corals in there. And like the fish store down the street from me, Frank's Tanks, he would have this huge bin, big, long, shallow, and he would just fill it up with water and bear and put in all the corals that just arrived, and he couldn't see anything because it's like putting it in milk. And then he would take out one at a time to deal with that coral, well, the thing is, I want you to know this so you don't make the same mistake. And I'm not saying he made a mistake. I'm warning you of a potential mistake. A lot of times what we do is we take out coral number one and we're inspecting it and we're looking at it and we're wondering what that is. And the other corals are cooking in the same dip. And then we get the second one out and we're working on it. And oh, it needs to be glued a little bit better. Or I want to cut off this frag plug. Or there's some algae I want to scrape away. And the other ones are still cooking and then the third one, and the fourth one. And by the time you get to the last one, it's been in that solution so long, the water has cooled off, the coral has been immersed in chemical to the point where it may be losing its life. So we wanna make sure that when the timer goes off, if it's a 10 minute duration, then you immediately take each of your corals out of this bucket and put them into the second bucket so they can rinse in some tank water. They can be in here basically, I'm going to say indefinitely, but that's, you know, a bit of an exaggeration. We want them to be into the clean water of the tank as soon as the dip is over and you can still deal with them. You can still pick off algae and you can uh, cut off frag plugs, glue the frag to a new frag plug, whatever it is you want to do. But this way you have not chemically burned any of your new corals because you let them sit in the solution too long. And that was really the main point of today's stream. I just wanted to focus the uh, the timing is critical. And if you make the mistake of working systematically, you'll end up causing problems. Now, let's say we do have this bucket and I've got 10 frags in here and it's taking me a while to do this. What can I do to keep these safe? You can actually pour out some of the water and add some more tank water to raise the temperature again into the system so that this water doesn't uh, cool off while it's sitting there next to you on your, your uh, countertop or your uh, your work area or if you're on the floor <laughs> but just putting in some more tank water would keep the temperature solid so you can continue to do what you're doing and not be in any kind of a hurry and that is your best bet now when it comes to cleaning the corals the brand new ones you've got you're holding it in your hand you're looking at it you might use a magnifying glass to study that frag and as you're looking closely you may see something that concerns you you may not recognize what it is not everything is evil but i know most of you think well if i don't know what this is i got to kill it so I'm not going to tell you not to do that, but you are sometimes eliminating cool things. Like, for example, if you had a snail that you got, and by the way, I don't quarantine the cleanup crew critters, but let's say you have this really cool snail and it had something on its shell. Your inclination might be, scrape it off, get rid of it, whatever that is. But it might be something nifty like a barnacle or some other cool little critter, a little feather duster or something. And those don't need, necessarily need to die. <laughs> they can be okay, and they are part of the natural ecosystem of the ocean, and you should not fear every single thing you see. I know some hobbyists that when they get brand new frags, wherever they're from, whether it's you know a big company like ORA, or if it's from their fish store that does propagation, or if it comes from another hobbyist, or uh, you know, what, whoever, a coral vendor, they will cut off the frag plug and throw it away. <laughs> and uh, they will glue that frag straight to the rock work or they will glue it to their own frag plug that has no algae, no pests, no questions. And you know, I understand that premise. Keep in mind that as you're handling these corals and you're dipping these corals, they are stressed, they are gonna slime. Um, and as you're even holding it in your hand, you know, you may be crushing its polyps a little bit. So you got to be gentle. You, you don't want to be super aggressive with whatever frag it is you're holding on to. And that could be leather. That could be gorgonian. That could be zoanthid. That could be SPS. That could be LPS. I mean, there's a lot of different types of corals we try to affix to things. And when you're holding it, you want to hold it very lightly. I, I'm basically using one or two fingertips just to kind of like keep it in place. And for example, I have a frag plug in my hand. I should have grabbed a dirty one, but here. We'll grab a supersized one that you can see on camera. So here you've got your frag plug 
and you've put some kind of glue. And I actually like this glue from Polyp Labs. This is the glue grenade, and I just think it's cool. I just love the name. And uh, inside are like a bajillion of these little glues. And the benefit of individual glues is that you can use it up rapidly. You're not going to have it sitting on the shelf to where it dries out and gets hard. Definitely, I sell bigger bottles if you want, you know, nonstop gluing. And uh, but these I use personally. <laughs> I enjoy them. And when Dwayne was here, he went through a million of these things. It was funny. And I was like, I don't care. I got more. So you can use your glue. You would apply it to the frag plug itself. Then you, I'm just use this as my demonstration. I'll take this cap right here and we'll pretend it's a frag. And I, let's say this frag, it's super, <laughs> I mean, this piece of plastic is super light and you know, it's not delicate, but it's a perfect example of trying to put a wet frag onto a dry frag plug. You've put the glue and you hold it and then maybe you have your fingertip on top and you're just like waiting for about 60 seconds. You could dip this with your, you know, you're still holding and dip it into some water and lift it back out. The salt water will kind of help the glue cure around the base a little bit. You could lift the frag off gently, kind of rub it into the glue and press down again and again wait 30 seconds, 60 seconds. And then once this is secure and you can let go and it stays in place, then you can very carefully put this in your tank. So uh, that's one of the methods that I use and I wanted to discuss that. But um, let's say you're not going to use a brand new frag plug. Let's say you have the coral, it's on the plug and there's just things on there you don't like. There are some techniques that work. Um, one would be my favorite is to use dental tools. And I usually would go to the dentist and say, hey, what do you have that you'll never use again in a human mouth? And they said, oh yeah, I've got some in the back. I'm like, great. And I was like, sell me a few of those. And I came home with these stainless steel, not great condition dental tools. Some were picks, some were blades, some were scrapers, you know, all these different shapes. And I could work off whatever's on the frag plug that concerned me, whether it was bubble algae or ulva, or some kind of a vermited tube. Uh, just whatever it is you see on there, you can scrape it away carefully. Other tools you could use would be like very small screwdrivers, like jeweler screwdrivers. You can just chip away and scrape things off. Um, you could use a razor blade very carefully. Don't slice your own, your other hand. And then uh, one of the things that can work sometimes is to use a very soft bristle toothbrush. And it's very important to be soft. If you use a medium or a coarse brush, you may actually damage the tissue of the coral. So you want soft and you're just gently brushing the area that you're trying to clean. Now, one technique that Jake Adams talked about at Magna, I don't know, 10 years ago, five years ago, I don't know when it was, he suggested, and I thought this was kind of brilliant, to use a water pick and fill up a water pick with salt water. And then you could actually jet the frag plug and all the stuff around the foundation of the frag to clean it of anything. Now, I don't know if he jetted the coral itself. I, he probably did not, but who knows? If you're trying to do something crazy like knock off Acropora flat, eating flatworms, <laughs> a water pick might be a great technique. Um, but the water pick idea was a nice way to, you know, and gently pressure wash that frag plug and get things cleaned up to where you can now take this and put it somewhere. Um, that's all the tools that I would recommend for cleaning it. Um, the different glues you can use because people are like, well, I don't want to buy the, fr the glue grenade. I, I want to buy something at the dollar store. You can. As long as it's cyanoacrylate, that is super glue gel, you can use it. I would recommend you only use something that says on the package it only has cyanoacrylate in it. If it has anything else, uh, I wouldn't use it in the tank. So there are certain brands that may have other things in it that are not safe for your aquarium, and I would urge you not to go that route. Uh, super glue itself won't work. It's too watery. You need super glue gel. So cyanoacrylate is the stuff you want to use. And uh, <clears throat> then another thing that I like to do when it comes to mounting uh, a coral in the tank, besides the glue, would be to use putty. So I've got this Aquascape putty that um, is made by DD, Aqua Solutions or Aquaristic. And uh, I've been using this forever. I love this stuff. And on the back of the box, there's a purple color. That is the color the putty will be. So it's sort of like a dark coralline color. They sell another version that's uh, concrete gray and it's ugly. I don't like it. So I literally just ordered a case of this from my supplier because it's in stock and it will be in my shop if you want to buy some of this to use yourself. Inside here are two different color uh, putties. One is going to be gray and one is going to be the reddish part. And it's like any kind of a putty uh, resin that you would put together. You take equal parts of both and you knead it up. 
Now, if you have some that's old like mine, because that happens to me a lot, you can put it in the microwave for a few seconds to kind of soften it. And when I say a few, not more than 15 seconds. That seems to be enough to warm it up slightly, make it soft enough to where I can knead it together. And I also recommend when you're using this stuff to wear rubber gloves on your hands. So as you're kneading it, the chemical is staying off your flesh and is staying in the rubber of the glove. And that's not just me being cautious. I personally know a person who went to the ER after mixing putty for the thousandth time in his hands and he had a anaphylactic shock. So he did, he was shocked that it even happened. He couldn't believe it. And he was doing a fragging demo and he had to be rushed out and everyone's sitting there with all their putty and their glue and their frags. And they're just like, is he gonna be okay? So wear your gloves if you're gonna use the two part putty, no matter what brand it is, just keep it off your, your skin. And that way you can mix it up. And I like to knead a small amount and then use that on two or three things and then make a little bit more. I don't try to make like a whole bunch and then hope to keep taking some from it because it turns hard in a few minutes. And then you're kind of at the point of no return and you have to throw away all the excess because you made too much in the first place. So I'd much rather recommend that you um, uh, make a little bit. And then another thing that I do with it is when I take the putty and I push it into the rock on my tank and then I try to put the frag in there. If the frag won't stay in the putty, and, and so this is a whole art to it. It's not just like putty, frag, done, <laughs> or glue, frag, done. Sometimes you gotta get creative. So I'm gonna describe to you some scenarios when it comes to applying a coral to your tank, uh, to your aquascape. So let's say we have this perfect spot on the rock work. You love where this coral is gonna go. It's the ideal spot, and we're gonna get more into that in a moment, but I just wanna jump ahead and talk about this. Um, you've got your ideal spot and you're going to apply it and you've taken the putty, you've kneaded it, and now you put it in the tank and you press it into the rock. You maybe put a divot and then you place the coral in there and you kind of pinch the putty around the base of the coral to act like a little bit of a volcano. Then what you could do is you could take something that has texture, whatever it is, like this weird frag plug right here, it's kind of a star shape that's handmade in New York. And you could press it into the putty to get rid of all your fingerprints. So it doesn't look like a hand was putting this on there. It's more textured and more interesting and uh, hopefully blends in better with the rock work. Um, if for some reason the coral will not hold onto the putty or the coral itself and the putty is not staying put, you may need to do a couple different things. Let's just pretend you put the, the coral with this frag plug into the spot with the putty and it's not holding. I will then take more putty and and apply it to the side like you're using Play-Doh and add more to fill in the gap and kind of add more quote unquote glue to glue that to the stone to where I'm happy. And then I take my hand and I wave it back and forth in front of the frag to see if the water flow will make that wiggle or dance or if it'll stay stable. Don't accidentally bump it. You know, your hand should be nearby but it shouldn't swat the coral because then you have to start all over again because you just broke it off. But you may have to add a little more putty here or there, you know, one or two or three different spots to get that ideal connection with the rock. Now let's say connection with the rock's not a problem, but the frag itself won't stay for some reason. Another technique uh, that I use, and I do it frequently, is for example, I had that ball of putty and I put the divot in there, which you could use anything. You could use the, the eraser end of a pencil and press in an indentation into the putty, put some of the glue inside the hole in the putty, put the frag into the glue, and then kind of squeeze the putty around it to seal the glued coral into its putty and press it into the tank and then of course apply it to the rock and then go ahead and maybe texture it or rub some sand on it or whatever it is that makes you, it feel like you don't just have these fingerprints, you know, this, this finger art happening in your aquarium. Uh, so that last technique of using glue and putty and glue, and then there's another one. <laughs> there's another one, another final technique if it still won't hold. So you've glued the coral to the putty, but you may need to glue the putty to the rock. I know that sounds stupid, but there's sometimes in certain cases where you're gonna say, oh, okay. And so you put some glue on the back of the putty and you press it in. And now the glue bonds the putty, you texture or you press the putty to, contour, to conform to the shape of what you're trying to look at and your frag stays. So that could be an Oreo cookie type of scenario where you're using glue, putty, glue, rock work. All right, now, the next thing I want to talk about, if you're not going to use glue and putty, is you can use rubber bands to hold something in place. You could use zip ties to hold something in place. 
and you could even use like mesh material uh, like when you buy a bag of avocados or back in the day when you used to buy strawberries they had like a net on the top and you could put or even you take an actual fish net and rip it off the frame and have the fabric and you can net something over the top to make it stay in place so the flow won't blow it across the reef tank and that netting can be very practical and it's very temporary uh, it might be on there for three days it may be up there up to a seven days depending on what coral you're trying to get to adhere to that area but after the duration you can remove the netting and there's your coral and it's done and you have to think about it um, for example you might use the netting if you're trying to secure a specific mushroom or recordia to a certain area because those are slimy and they won't glue and they won't putty so to do that is one method another weird technique that i've seen people do but i'm you know i i, I don't choose to do it they take a toothpick and they put it right through the coral, whether it's a leather or it's a, a zoanthid or mushroom, and they stab it into a rock and it has to stay there impaled to the rock. I don't feel great about that one, so I don't really recommend it, but it has been done. Uh, I do want to talk about zip ties for a second, in that zip ties are not always all plastic. And if you look at the zip ties you own, you should look at the little tine inside there. And if it's a piece of metal, you probably don't want to use that inside your reef tank. Instead, when you're shopping for zip ties, actually look really closely at what's inside the packaging and find the ones that are just completely plastic because those you can use in your reef. And I remember I had a chunk of an acro years ago and it was you know about this big around and I needed it to be in a certain spot and I zip tied it with one or two zip ties on some Tonga branch and just ignored it. <laughs> I trimmed off the extra of the zip so you just had the strap and you had the coral and you had the Tonga branch. And the coral just grew and grew and grew. And I never got around to cutting off the zip tie because it doesn't do any harm. And what was really neat, and I've got this picture buried somewhere in my hard drive, the tissue grew over the zip ties. And so you could see the branch and you could see the coral. And it was like this very specific seatbelt look through the tissue. And you could see the polyps coming off of it. It was really neat looking. I actually kind of liked it. You know? and, but uh, ideally, once the coral is secure, you can reach into your tank with some kind of snips temporarily. Typically, those are going to be made of metal, whether it's scissors, bone cutters, uh, or actual wire cutters, and cut off the zip tie, remove it, clean your tools really well so they don't get ruined by the salt water, and your coral should stay put. Um, another technique that's used by some when you're trying to get corals to adhere to something is they'll use something called a shroom basket for mushroom basket. And they'll have something made of acrylic or plastic or whatever, a bowl of some kind, and they fill it with larger grade gravel. Um, maybe even crushed coral, and they will put the mushrooms inside this basket and leave them there and make sure the flow, you know, they get light, they get water, but they're not getting flow to blow them out of the box. And then the mushrooms grab onto that gravel, hopefully. And then after that's, a, that's happened, you can literally take the mushroom, flip it over, put glue on the gravel, and glue the gravel to wherever you want in your tank, and now you've placed a mushroom where you want it to be. Now, will the mushroom stay? No guarantees. No guarantees. <laughs> Those things will do whatever they want, and they will spread, and they will be everywhere one day. But if you can uh, start off, and you're like, I'm trying to do this aquascape, and I really like the idea of these being in this corner, but my flow is just moving everything, that's a technique. You let them grab onto something solid, and then you secure that solid thing however you need to with some glue. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is placement in the tank. So if you have brand new corals, I always, always recommend you don't put them exactly where they need to be in your tank. I recommend you put them down on the, on the bottom of the tank, typically on the substrate, which in my tank is always sand. Some of you have bare bottom tanks. That means you're going to put it down on the bottom of the tank. Uh, some of you might say, well, I'll use a frag rack. <clears throat> I'm not a fan of frag racks. I don't like the look. It never seems natural. It never belongs. It spoils the view of the reef tank, in my opinion. And, you know, I understand if you were doing some fragging, getting ready for a frag swap, and you put in a frag rack temporarily in your tank to hold those frags for a few days so that they'd be ready for Saturday morning. I understand that premise. But the problem is I see people that have a frag rack in their tank all the time. It is part of the ecosystem. It just does not look good, and I don't recommend it. But, uh, you know, that's your choice. You do what you, do you okay? <laughs> I, just, I hate the look, and I highly recommend that you only use them when you need to. If you have to to uh, put corals in your tank that you just acquired. Putting them on a frag rack for two or three days down low in the tank is smart. 
You can put them way down low, and because they're magnetic usually, you can slide them up a little bit higher to get them a little bit more light after a week or two. But uh, another option would be to have a little frag tray that sits on the bottom of the tank where it holds three or six frags, and it just it keeps them from rolling around or falling over. And then, you know, when the coral has completely gotten used to your system, gotten used to your water, gotten used to your fish, gotten used to your lighting, uh, gotten used to your parameters, <laughs> then you can start to put them where you want them in the tank and you can start considering where's the best spot for this one coral. In the past for me, it's been um, an unfortunate, weird coincidence that I'll have like the perfect spot to put a coral, but it will, I mean, it's like, I have nowhere else I can put it. Like that's the spot. But the bad part is it is the wrong spot for that color of coral. So I was like, oh, I, I like that spot. I mean, it's a great spot. It's got good flow, good light, but I just put the green with the greens. Uh, I just put the red with the reds. I just put the browns with the browns. And I, it happens to me hundreds of times where when you're planting a coral, your ideal plan, and I've heard this in some presentations and they talk about the color wheel, like if you're doing stuff in Photoshop or if you're an artist, I mean, they know way more about this than I do. They will say, if you have this color here, you let's say the color is, I, look, I don't know my opposites here, so don't uh, judge me harshly here, but let, I'm going to pretend I see a color wheel in my head right now as I describe this. Let's say you're putting a red coral in your tank. Maybe it's a blasto or a mushroom. Then what's the opposite side of the color wheel? Maybe it's blue. Then you want a blue tort or you want a blue zoanthid next to it. And then you can work your way across the reef, constantly changing the opposite sides of the color wheel to where you have this nice diverse uh, arrangement of colors rather than clusters of the same color, cluster of the same color, cluster of the same color, which has been my horrible, horrible habit for a super long time. So when Dwayne was here, <clears throat> we intentionally planted all the frags in different areas of the tank so that we'd have the contrasts that we wanted. And that was a perfect plan until last week when things went south in my reef and I started losing corals. So uh, I will be getting more corals in a month or so. And when I do that, I will be in, I will definitely be looking at where I'm going to place things in my tank to create the contrast, to create a more vivid experience. Because there have been people that have looked at my reef and, you know, they watch the YouTube channel and they'll say, you know, yeah, your corals are big and healthy, which wasn't true. Uh, <laughs> they were big, uh, but they weren't the way they needed to be. And they said, but your tank is so boring. You don't have anything cool. You don't have any of the high dollar stuff. I'm like, yeah, I, I, it's not really my desire to spend... 500 on a frag or whatever it is because it's got a nickname. It's just not my my Not my cup of tea is uh, the way I look at that. But if you were to uh, Get a few nice pieces. It definitely adds some nice color to your tank It just has to fit your budget. It has to be something you want And invariably when things go wrong in your tank usually the high dollar stuff is the first stuff to die So you have to also look at your risk factor. How comfortable are you with that kind of a risk? But uh, so placement, like I said, if you're starting them down low, they've gotten used to your system, now they're safe to move. Also, by leaving them down there for a week or two, you're not handling them. You already handled them a bunch during the dip, during the inspection, during the cleaning, and then maybe uh, putting them on a frag plug, and then finally they're on the tray, now leave them alone, don't touch them for a couple of weeks, and let them recover from human contact. And then you can then place them where you need them in your tank. And you may decide at that point, you know, this uh, frag, this frag disc is great, but the button on the bottom is too big and too long and it doesn't fit anywhere. I don't want that. You can then get bone cutters and you can snip off the bump to where you just have a flat disc and there's no more posts sticking off of there. And you can actually affix this to like the side of a rock or at an angle instead of trying to find a rock with a perfect hole to put that post into to secure it in your tank. So you can always alter the way the frag plug is shaped with different tools. Um, sometimes they're really hard to cut, but some are a little bit more easy. That one I just showed you actually had, it was designed to let you break that off. When you looked at the, uh, uh, the ceramic of that material, there was a post and there was a notch in it. And the idea was that with that notch, it was actually enough that you could break it or, or get a cutter on there and snip it off easily instead of going through some solid uh, ceramic media that was a little harder to break up. Um, and then finally, another thing that we have to think about when you're planting corals in your tank that are brand new frags is the proximity to other corals. Are you putting them too close to a neighbor? Are you putting them close to something that could kill it? Could, that could kill it? 
Uh, for example, you might say, oh, I have the best golden torch, came from Australia, it's worth a million dollars. And then you get something pretty you like and you put it over here, forgetting that at night the torch puts out sweepers eight inches long and will just sting to death this new neighbor. So you have to make sure there's enough space all the way around your corals that are planted and that already exist so that they have room to grow without interacting. And that is a very important thing to think ahead. And one of the things that new hobbyists loves to do is they like to get more and more and more frags. They get super excited, they see all these cool things, and they end up buying, you know, in a short period of time, somewhere upwards of 50 or 70 or 100 frags. And someone that's been in the hobby a long time will just look at that and nod and say, yep, I understand why you did it, but that's not going to work long term. And you will end up with 12 colonies. <laughs> because 100 frags are not going to, you know, stay strong. You're going to have some that are going to die, some that are going to fall, some that are going to get picked on by hermit crabs or whatever. And then you're going to have some that get really big and they are going to sting their neighbors and you're going to end up with like 6 to 12 colonies in your system and the other, whatever I said, 100, so let's just say 88 didn't make it. So maybe be more judicious in what you're buying and choose, I want these specific corals for sure. I know it's going to take a long time to fill in. I'm okay with that. I'm going to be patient and enjoy the ride rather than trying to fill in every little square inch of rock because there's a blank spot and you can do it. Uh, there's also the tendency, and I've seen this a lot, and you know, with some tanks it looks good, but uh, some tanks it doesn't. Uh, there's a tendency to like fill up the sand bed or fill up the, the, the bottom of the tank with like all kinds of pieces, but if it just looks like a bunch of discs, and when I mean discs, I mean like these frag discs, you know, like if you had a whole bunch of these right here, <laughs> There's just these things on the on the tank, and each in the middle of each one has like a small puddle of chalice, and all you see is a bit of red, a bit of green, a bit of orange, a bit of blue, a bit of green, a bit of. And, but there's all these big ceramic circles. It's not pretty at all. It doesn't even look normal. It it kind of looks like you're shopping at the LFS. So, if you wanted a chalice to grow out and cover the glass of the bottom of your tank, or cover a very thin layer of rock sitting on the sand to hide the rock, you know, to have this really nice, I mean, you can't see it, it's off frame, but I have one chalice that I really love and it's doing great in that corner and there's nothing under it. It's just growing on the sand and it's totally fine. It is making its own self larger and larger. The, uh, I understand that premise, that desire. And some corals have to be down on the bottom of the tank. The big donut corals, the meaty corals, the, uh, the fungias, all those need to be down there. But sometimes it just kind of looks like you left all your toys out. <laughs> so um, not trying to talk you into being minimalist. I, my reef has kind of become a little bit of minimalist, some intentionally and some because of uh, recent losses. But to have some open areas and some negative space and to have uh, some sand that's wide open that, you know, if you have certain fish, I like to turn it over or you have uh, certain critters like to eat the sand and, and emerge from the sand, like sleep in the sand, like grasses. You know, it's nice to have some area where they can go in and, and live and do their thing and not just be covered every square inch with some kind of a coral. So pick what you like to have and try to resist the urge to fill every uh, void in the tank because eventually you'll, you'll, uh, you'll figure it out. You'll say, oh, now I see what Mark was talking about back in uh, August of 2021. <laughs> So that is kind of uh, most of my list. Uh, the last thing I would say is after you've done all these things, don't let up on your observation of the aquarium. Constantly look at things very closely. Again, a macro lens on a camera is ideal. A magnifying glass like the flipper, I love those things and I, I'm constantly picking them up and using them. And you know they'll hold onto the edge of your tank with a magnet and you can go ahead and you can look right through it and move it to a different spot. and. Uh, you can study different things in your tank and see if they're healthy. See if there is a pest in your tank. And if there is, uh, reach out you know, through Club Mealer's Reef and let us know what you've discovered and ask us the best approach for handling it because we have a bunch of hobbyists in there that are really happy to assist you in uh, being successful. And one of the, uh, the things that I always try to do when I'm solving a pest problem is I want to remove the pest. I don't want to destroy my reef in the process. So if I... Uh, you know, I mentioned this uh, you know, earlier, the Acropore eating flatworms, which are essentially invisible until you see their damage. Um, one of the 
the, the recommendations that is dominant out there is to take every piece of Acropora out of your tank and every bit of Acropora tissue, any kind of puddle, any bit of tissue that exists in the rock, scrape it off, remove it all and leave the tank completely Acropora free so those things will starve off and die. And now you have all these corals and you got to put them somewhere. So you set up a temporary tank, you've got lighting over it, you've got some kind of a power head for flow, you know, you're, um, you may have hooked up some kind of filtration. You might think you've set up a whole new system just to hold all these corals in a hospital scenario. And then every week you take the coral out and you dip it, like we talked about today, and you handle it and then you inspect it and you turkey baste. Oh, that was another thing I didn't mention. When you're rinsing off a frag, you could turkey baste it to blow off any garbage off of the coral or to knock off any pests. That's a, another nice useful tool. This one's all plastic. I've ha also had the kind where the tube was glass. Um, but you're working these corals and you're rinsing them and all that and then you put them back in the tank and then a week from now you dip them again and you, a week from now you dip them again and you do that every single week for like six or eight or 12 weeks because you're trying to make sure none of the acropora eating flatworms survived. But the problem is, number one, everything has changed for those acros. They're being handled every single week. They're being put in a chemical every single week. They're being blasted with a different type of flow every week. And they're sitting with new neighbors they never sat next to before. The lighting is different. The flow is different. Everything is different. And invariably, most people that went to this crazy regime of doing all this effort to save their corals end up losing about 80 to 90% of them. And so I never, I never took that approach when I found those flatworms in my tank. Instead, I just took a uh, turkey baster the first time. I filled it up with RO water. I turned off the flow in the tank and I would just gently squeeze the plunger to force all of the, or the, the bulb, all the RO water onto the coral. And in salt water, you can see when there's a patch of RO water, it's like oil and water and, or yeah, oil and water. And you can see it just looks different. And if there's any acropora eating flatworms on that coral, they will just start peeling off. And then, uh, and you can do this several times, just that one colony, you can just squirt RO water, get some more, do it again, do it again, do it again. And you'll just see them peeling off and then you can pump them off with a, a turkey baster. And uh, if you're lucky, you'll have antheists that are nearby, they're just gonna gobble them up, which is really convenient. And then you take your hand and you wave it back and forth to mix the RO with the salt water so that coral is not sitting in RO water indefinitely. We don't want it sitting in a, in a cocoon of RO water for 15 or 20 minutes. Within a few minutes, it, you've already accomplished what you need to do. And I did that originally, but this became too tedious. I was working in a 280 gallon reef tank and instead I chose to use a MaxiJet powerhead. And I just held the powerhead in my hand, you know, with a nozzle pointing straight out and I just pointed at the coral and held it there for 20 seconds, just squirting or blasting that one spot on this colony until a flatworm flew off and the antheus came and gobbled it up. And I moved over slightly and hit another part of the coral because I knew which corals had the infestation. You could see the damage and you could also tell what corals didn't have any infestation at all. And those corals don't need to have anything done to them. And I worked my way through the, the two or three corals that had an issue. I eliminated the problem, the antheus ate the problem. <laughs> And I never lost those corals. Those corals stayed with me the whole time. There are other techniques you can use as well, but I like to do the minimally invasive approach with some of these things, because I don't really want to have to break them off the rock work, deal with it elsewhere, and then somehow glue it back in because it never goes back in the way it came out of your tank. Invariably something will happen. Or if it's a big enough piece, it will have grown onto different rocks. And now when you break it off, the rocks start shifting or falling down and, and it has a bunch of other corals and it becomes this whole domino effect. And we don't want to do that either. So if you can handle it in the tank, if you can deal with it, with one of these more um, manually uh, intense approaches, but uh, not actual physical removal of the tank, I think that's more than ideal. Um, I also want to talk about, while we're talking about coral dipping, doing too much at a time. And this goes in very well with my reef diary that I've been doing daily where people have said, you did too much with your reef. Okay, I'm not gonna argue that. I did a lot with my reef and you're not wrong. And it's just unfortunate that it got away from me, okay? But um, if you're planting a lot of corals on the same day, and if you're using a lot of putty on the same day, it can cause problems in your aquarium because there's just too much chemical in the water. So if you have 20 corals you wanna plant in your tank, 
I would recommend you plant six today and you plant six tomorrow and six the day after and six the day after that, instead of trying to plant all 24 today. It might be way easier for you to do it all today while your hands are wet and the glue is open and, and you've got time, but all that chemical in the water could affect these brand new frags as well as the existing corals and harm them. And uh, it also can affect your protein skimmer and it may not skim properly because of too much stuff. So if you're doing this in small bursts, you're gonna have more of a successful experience. So glue a few corals, leave the rest on the little tray on the bottom of your tank or down in the sand, and uh, then you know do a few more and do a few more, rather than trying to do it all at once is gonna be my recommendation. Well, that is it for today's live stream topic. The next part here, we're gonna go into the question and answer part on YouTube. So if you have any questions on there, feel free to type at Mila's Reef and then put your questions. And I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye to you guys on Instagram. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you guys have a great weekend. So I have to hit end and I gotta put a something on here, I think. We're just gonna go with that. All right, see, if I don't actually end it, it just evaporates. <laughs> So thank you for your patience. I'll turn that off. Now come to the YouTube chat and look and see what you guys have been writing me. <laughs> um, Paul says, first from Europe and the UK. You're in all of that? <laughs> you must move around a lot. Let's see. Foreign Reefer got it here from the very beginning. I made it from the beginning. Woohoo! <laughs> Elbow cough. Let's see. Uh, Alex says, do you know if frags have a higher chance of survival than colonies? Yeah, that's actually a great question. And I think it is a reason why so many people will buy a frag versus a colony. The colony itself is established, it's used to a certain uh, scenario, a certain climate, and when you uproot it and put it somewhere else, it may not make it, or you may lose a big piece of it and you're back down to frags again. So it's actually better to buy the frags. And let me tell you, there's a reason why people love, love to buy frags. They see these bright, colorful, fantastic works of art. They're just like, oh my God, have you seen that? Oh my God, look what I bought. And everyone's like, oh, where did you get that? I need that. And we all go gaga because a brand new little coral, a brand new frag has so much energy in its core to grow. It's just bursting with color. It's bursting. It's just so stunning. It's kind of like when you're at the jewelry store and you're looking at all those diamonds, <laughs> they're gorgeous, right? I mean, they're just like, oh, each one's better than the last one. You can't make your mind which diamond you want to buy. But then once they're on a ring, just depends how it's going to look, you know? And, you know, there's, there's a thing where you can have too much of something and it doesn't look as good anymore. It, it might look expensive. Like, for example, let's say uh, there was some kind of a, a woman's necklace just covered in diamonds, you know, like Victoria's Secret would do when they made a bra out of diamonds. And it's just a big sparkly bra. And yeah, there's a lot of diamonds, but you can't appreciate the diamonds. You're kind of more looking at the cleavage. <laughs> so you're totally missing the point. Uh, the point is, is that uh, when it comes to colonies versus frags, the frags usually look more colorful, they're more vivid, and they're more prone to grow well, where a colony may sit there and do nothing for a long time. And then eventually, okay, I guess I can grow. And it starts to do its thing. Ideally, you want to have things that are small and uh, because you'll have more, it's easier to place it in the tank it's easier to glue it in place because it's not top heavy and the uh, the only reason I like mini colonies is so the tank doesn't look so empty so when I'm shopping for anything I don't look for the smallest little nub I don't care about that because I know I've said this many times if I can't see it from three feet away there's no point getting it because it's invisible to me so I want something of a decent size and that's why when we did the reset on the reef and we had these huge colonies and we cut it down to something that was, you know, about the size of a lemon or, or smaller, that's where we planted here, 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 and here so that the tank didn't look empty. And so having these little mini colonies is a great way. But I was, that again, is not like buying it. That was resetting what I owned. If you're at the LFS and you see 
a small little colony and they're willing to sell it like that, you don't you shouldn't shy away from it necessarily. If you can afford it and you like it, you can get it. it back in the old days, we would buy colonies and put them in our tank because well, it was faster. <laughs> Your tank looked better sooner. And I remember there's this crazy experience where a guy, um, he bought a colony of something, uh, maybe Montefiore Digitata, and he had the bag, and he, sees, and, you know, he bought it at the fish store for like 40 bucks. And then as he was walking into the house, he dropped the bag, and it hit the concrete and it shattered, and he had 20 pieces. And so he posted on our club's forum uh, on DFW Mass, hey, I just bought this colony. <laughs> I mean, he was very honest. <laughs> he said, I bought this colony for 40 bucks and I dropped it and I broke it. So I've got 20 frags and they're $20 each. And I said, wait, you bought the whole thing for $40 and you're trying to make $400 or whatever the number was, you know, $800 in frags off of what you shattered? And he wrote me a private message back and says, just delete my thread. <laughs> Because even he realized, that's insane. But uh, back then, you know, it was fine to share frags or sell frags. I mean, I'm not dissing on that, but when you admit you originally got it for 40 bucks and yet you're going to turn it into, you know, a, a giant thing, it was kind of a little insane to me. It was a 2 a.m. thing, too, so I think we were both a little bit uh, past our bedtimes and being a little bit silly. But the uh, getting frags from others and planting them in our tanks is a lot easier than trying to plant in colonies. The Musical Reefs, uh, thank you very much for your super chat. He said, just wanted to say, uh, keep up the great work, Mark. I love today's video and the Reef Diaries. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I had fun sharing that one video yesterday with Caitlin, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed it and, and took it in the spirit it was intended. I, I realize there's a lot of ways to interpret things when you're watching them, but I remember when we were trying to film this, I was just like, we were just standing in front of the tank, and I was like, okay, let me just do this right quick with you. This, we'll just do it real quick and I can paste this thing on the end of today's video that I've got to release. And she wasn't focused or she was focused on Jack. And uh, all I needed was her to put, you know, a few cohesive words together. <laughs> and the thing is, I speak extemporaneously all the time. I mean, you do that every minute of your life, actually. If you get a phone call on the phone, you just start talking. You don't have a script. When you go to the store and you're shopping, you have thoughts in your head and you use them. When you have people come over for dinner or company or watch a movie, you talk about things and the conversation just flows. So what happens with Caitlin and others is that when the camera's on, your brain freezes. <laughs> it's like you drank a Slurpee too fast and you get very self-conscious. You wonder how you look, how you're standing, how's your hair. You know, are you smiling too much? Are you laughing? Are you wiggling? You know, I mean, there's all these things going in your head. Um, and, you know, of course, you're thinking, I don't want to look dumb. And in my case, I usually try to have the conversation with them two or three times, and eventually we'll find something I can use, and I can go ahead and make a nice video. Um, but that day was not working, and Jack was not cooperating. And I finally, I know halfway into that thing, I was, internally, I was very annoyed we couldn't just get this. And, uh, but we were really good friends at that time. And, uh, you know, she wasn't mad. I mean, she was relieved when I turned off the camera. I can guarantee you that. But we watched it and she's like, she, I remember putting on Facebook all those screenshots that I showed you at the very beginning. And, uh, she said, this is, look, here's a, here's proof that Mark and I did an interview in front of his tank that he'll never re reveal. <laughs> he'll never release it. And I was like, it's terrible. I can't use one frame of it. <laughs> and everyone's like, we want to see the raw uncut footage. And, you know, like I said, that was shot in 2017. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it was a year later or two years later, people were like, we still want to see it. And I was like, eh. So then uh, last week, my phone was maxed out. It's, it, there's only so much room in the hard drive. And I'm like, you know, this much from a, a progress bar of fullness. I was down to like maybe three gigs of empty space. It was insane. And so I went to the beginning of my camera roll to my videos to see what I could remove to make space because I assume videos are going to be the bigger, biggest offenders. And when I got, I started in 2014 and worked my way up. When I got to 2017, I found our fun little uh, failure of an interview. And I thought, oh, this would be a great thing to share on the uh, anniversary of her death if it doesn't offend people. And because uh, I didn't know if, how people would take it. 
but the comments uh, yesterday seemed really good. Uh, I think you, I think the audience took it the right way. I'm glad for that because I would never want to do anything that makes her look less than you know, the greatest person ever. You know, she um, she was really important to me. She still is. I mean, I, she, she continues to be even after death. So I, I shared that yesterday, and it seemed like a lot of you guys enjoyed it. And we even had some cussing in it. So I did. <laughs> and you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, and I don't know if you care. But uh, like things that pertain to Caitlyn on my channel, like when I did that thing with the uh, candles and the flowers, um, and there was a couple other things I've done. Those are never monetized. I don't put any uh, advertising on those because it seems like that's just improper. So I just share something because she's that important to me and I, I kind of want her to live on. And so I like to kind of bring her back into your memory because, you know, <laughs> I don't want her to be forgotten. So ah, anyway, let's move on to the questions. Um, Ed says my audio might be slightly out of sync. <sighs> I can't fix that at this point. I can't like reset it without stopping the stream and starting it in. So that kind of sucks. Sometimes that happens when you uh, hook up the camera too soon before you start. And um, so like today we set up everything and then I quickly went to get ready for a camera. And when I was done, I uh, came over here and hit play and it might've got out of sync. So I might, you know, usually I hit start right at the right moment, but I don't know. We'll see. I can't ever get everything right at the same time, huh, Ed? Uh, Mr. Reefbuster says, is there an easy way to remove Zoa frags from a frag plug and glue them onto a rock? I have trouble with Zoas because they are so small and delicate as opposed to SPS or LPS frags. Well, you can usually get, un get them off the frag plug with a razor blade. And if they're on the rock working, you're trying to remove them. There was one person in our club that had this really cool technique where they took a razor blade and they had their boulder covered in zoanthids or palithoa or whatever it was they had. <clears throat> and they would use the razor blade and go under the foot of the coral and actually under the coralline. And they would scrape to where the, the polyp came off with the coralline still attached. And they could put a drop of glue on the coralline and put it on a new frag plug to sell it. And I thought, oh, that's pretty smart. And if you didn't want the frag plug, if you just wanted just the way it was with the coralline, they'd give it to you that way, and you could put the glue on it and put it on your rock work. So that was nice. But generally speaking, you're going to wear gloves. You're going to wear eye protection. You keep your mouth closed so you don't squirt any zoanthid juice in your mouth. Uh, because if you're just, like, focused and your mouth is hanging open because your mouth breathing for some reason, you could get some palytoxin poisoning. Um, but you carefully trim it off the frag plug, and then it will be slimy but you can blot the zoanthid on a paper towel to get it dry, put the glue on there, and then put it on your wherever it is you're gonna glue it. If you wanted to speed up the gluing process, there is an accelerant designed for super glue and super glue gel, we used it with super glue gel, and you would spray the accelerant on the area you're gonna do first, which usually was like a frag plug um, or a rock that was out of the tank very temporarily. You'd blot it, you'd spray it with this mist You'd put the glue and you'd hold it and it'd grab on in about 10, 15 seconds. And that was nice and convenient. But uh, I haven't heard anyone do that in a very long time. I don't know if that's still a popular choice. Oh, good. Ed says the audio has caught up. <laughs> Yay, thank you, YouTube. <laughs> oh, there was one more thing I wanted to mention to you when you're trying to clean a frag plug of uh, let's say an algae infestation. I meant to talk about this in the first part. So um, another trick that works, let's say you have this frag plug. Oops. And uh, we'll grab this big gray one. You got your frag plug and there's a coral sticking off of it and it's just covered in algae. It could be hair algae, it could be bryopsis, it could be valonia, just uh, something green and evil and you don't want it in your tank. You could take the coral, wearing rubber gloves so you don't get, you know, your skin's oils on the tissue because you're holding it by the frag. And you could take a very small, shallow container, uh, like a, I love using those little individual cups, like fruit comes in or uh, applesauce, you know, the kind of things you give to a kid. And that little plastic cup, fill it up with some peroxide, and you can hold the frag from the top and put the plug into the peroxide or put the plug in the peroxide at an angle and twist it to where peroxide is touching all of it, but the peroxide never gets on the coral itself. 
So the coral is staying above the peroxide, but you're focused on getting all areas of the frag plug covered in peroxide for about three minutes. And after that time, you could then rinse the coral or take the whole coral with frag plug and dip it in some tank water, like just a quick little bowl of tank water, just dip it there to get the peroxide out of the system. And then you can put it in your tank. And within about three days, everything you saw in there that was green that you didn't quite remove yourself manually will turn white, turn clear, and fall right off and be gone. So peroxide is another nice tool for removing algae off of frag plugs. Uh, Malcolm says, how the hell do you get rid of Asterina starfish? Well, you know, I don't. Uh, my tank has a bunch of them, as far as I know. I haven't looked for them specifically in the last week. So it'd be interesting if they went away. But uh, normally, they're just on the glass. They come out at night. You'll see them everywhere. Uh, if you look really hard, you may see them on the rock work. You may see them going up the side of a coral. Um, <laughs> occasionally, you'll see one on the side of a fish, which is kind of crazy, especially if a fish is resting. But sometimes you'll see something crazy, like a, a Nasso, like Spock, swimming around with an Asterine on its side um, <laughs> for, for a little bit, you know, and then it finally gets off of there again. But I've never found them to be an invasive, horrible, vicious, uh, murdering pest. So I don't worry about them. Now, there are certain ones, they're not common, that can do some damage in your tank. And I remember once I uh, looked at my tank, and late at night I had this little frag, maybe an inch and a half tall, and an Asterina went right up the side and left a trail of white. I mean, it just murdered that, that frag. And I was like, how dare you? You've got to go. And I took that Asterina out of my tank, and I looked at it under the, uh, the lighting of my, my uh, kitchen lights. And uh, the color was different than the other Asterinas. So I'm going back with my memory. It seems like the tan ones were fine, but I think it was if it was a bluish one, it might have been more aggressive. So anyway, I started looking for that exact looking one in my tank and then pulled out them with tweezers and eliminated them. That was the problem. I mean, that was the end of it. It, it didn't become anything. I do remember at one point uh, in the days of the 280 gallon reef, I had so many Asterinas, my nitrates and phosphates, especially my phosphates were crazy high because I was feeding so many tangs and I was putting in a full sheet of nori every single day and I could not get my phosphates to come down at all. This is way back in 2004, 2005. And I had millions of Asterinas, it was amazing, but it was too many. And it was more than I wanted to remove with tweezers or forceps, you know, large tweezers. And so I got myself a pair of Harlequin shrimp and harlequin shrimp love to eat starfish, and that is their primary diet. And I found this mated pair at the fish store. One was pink and one was blue, so clearly one was a girl and one was a boy. And I put them in my tank, and they hung out together, and they're really pretty. And um, I kept wondering, well, how will they ever get these asterinas? They're all over the glass. I mean, the shrimp are down here on the sand, and the asterinas are way up here, safe and sound. How's that going to work out? But I didn't, you know, I just kind of forgot about it. And, you know, from time to time, I'd be looking in the tank with a flashlight, and I'd see the uh, harlequin shrimp. This is all during, like, the first week. And they're so pretty, and I took a couple nice pictures and put them on my website, blogged about it, you know. And then um, I'd say about two weeks later, three weeks later, I was looking at the tank, and it dawned on me, hey, where are all my asterinas? <laughs> I don't see any. That's crazy. And then I said, hey, where are my harlequin shrimp? <laughs> I don't see any. That's crazy. I lost the shrimp too. I, I have no. I mean, you know, you're supposed to, if you get these shrimp, you get them to do starfish population control. But then your job is to feed them the rest of their natural life, which means you have to go buy a starfish at the fish store. And what people typically do is they buy one starfish, and you know it typically has five arms, and they will freeze it, and they will cut off one arm and give that to the harlequin shrimp to eat, like once a week. They give them an arm. And I never even got to that point. I just, <laughs> it just dawned on me, hey, I've got no Asterinas. Hey, I've got no shrimp that eat Asterinas. So uh, there you go. That's the long answer. Uh, Harlequin shrimp do to the job, but then you either have to return the shrimp to the fish store to someone else that could use them, or you're going to have to feed them starfish for the rest of your life. <clears throat> uh, Problem prone said a week ago you said you lost a red dragon acro and we're going to get another one Where do you recommend picking one up? Thank you and always look forward to Saturday's live stream 
Uh, Frank's Tanks has several pieces of Red Dragon, so I was able to just go down there, but I didn't get it yet. I debated it, I talked with him about it, you know, I told, you know he knows what's going on with the tank because I've been complaining. And uh, I said to him, I kind of just want to get another one to put in the tank now. And he's like, yeah, I understand that. And I said, because technically that new frag will be getting better water than my previous ones got. And they wouldn't even know the drama the tank went through. I mean, it's going to go in not knowing anything's wrong and probably be fine. He goes, yeah, you're probably right. But I decided I'm just going to hold off. I'm just going to kind of let the tank settle down before I introduce anything new. So I didn't buy it. So in about two or three weeks, four weeks, something, you know, three to four weeks, there's going to be some new corals introduced to the tank. But for a little bit, there's going to be some areas that are going to be kind of boring for me. Um, I'm still seeing some decay. We'll be talking about that later in the today's Reef Diary. But for now, um, just going to the fish store. Also, talking with other hobbyists that have, you know, aquariums in your local area is a great way to get corals. If you're part of a club, you can reach out to the club. If you're part of a Facebook group, you can check, you know, that way. But be careful because on Facebook, you're not allowed to sell livestock. And so if they see your conversation, um, you could get someone in trouble. So keep it, you know, private messages and stuff. But anyway, uh, I talked with someone yesterday. I hadn't talked to him in a long time. His name's Keith. He's, real, he's a real nice guy. Good friend of mine, but we hadn't spoken. It, life has been difficult. And while we were talking, I mentioned to him what was going on in my reef, and he was unaware. And he said, well, Mark, I don't have a lot of choices, but everything I do have, I have a ton of it. So if you need some corals, I'd, be, I'd love to put some of those in your tank. So see, there's an opportunity for me to get some coral for my tank from a local person. And then Dwayne said, you know, he's got a whole bunch set aside for me that he'll ship me. So that's another opportunity. And uh, I know a couple other people where I can get stuff. And of course, I can just start doing the LFS tour and just kind of go a little bit crazy out there. And of course, I can reach out to Ryan as well with his thousand gallon reef. He's got a lot of coral and it's all doing really, really well. And for him to snip a few pieces out, you'd never even notice it. <laughs> so there's a chance I might get some stuff from Ryan as well, who's only about an hour away. So that's kind of the answer to your question. That's where they come from. And when you were like, well, how are you gonna get another one? It's like, well, because there was a rack of them. And I was like, well, I'll take this one. And I knew there was three still left. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rob B's Reef says, is the Bayer something specific to reefing or is it a brand name aspirin? It's a type of medicine used for um, an insecticide. And it's meant for like being used outdoors on your property. And someone discovered you could use it to dip corals in. <laughs> So you can do a, you can Google that. It's very popular. It's been around for many years, and uh, a lot of people do it. Myself, I've never done it. I've, I've not even bought it. So, no, that's up to you. Uh, CT says, can a sump only have two chambers? One being the inflow chamber with a filter roller and skimmer, and the second chamber be the outflow return pump chamber? Yeah, absolutely. I would recommend between those two chambers you have triple baffles and make sure those baffles are at least one inch apart, you know, a physical distance of one inch between the baffles. Not you put one at 11 inches, 12 inches, 13 inches, because then it's only three quarters of an inch. The closer the baffles are, the more rapidly water will slingshot through it. And if there's micro bubbles that got through your rollers or your skimmer, or even bubbles coming out of the skimmer, they will go right through and into the return zone and the return pump will suck those bubbles in with the water and pump bubbles into your tank. And you'll have these uh, visual artifacts that are, you know, spoiling the view. So you want to make sure the return zone is bubble free. So I always recommend triple baffles. You go over, under, over. That's, I've always recommended that. A ton of people do the opposite. They, this is a highly debated thing, like which way do you put the roll, the roll of toilet paper on the roller? Um, but over, under, over is my recommendation. It works really, really well one inch apart between each baffle, and the middle baffle should be an inch and a half off the bottom of the sump. If you do that, yeah, you can do it with two chambers. I'm looking for the next question. Um, there's a lot of questions about where you can get a sump or what you can do. So there's a few options. You can order some from me and you have to wait for me to build it. Uh, you can get a glass aquarium and you can order the baffles from me and I will actually cut them the exact right height and width to fit your aquarium and I can ship those to you. And then you can silicone those in yourself. Or you can go to a local glass supplier and have them cut the baffles 
And then if you do that, if you're going to have them make them out of glass, measure your tank inside. It's so important that you measure the exact inner width. A lot of people think, oh, it's this. I saw the dimensions on the website. Please stop doing that. Get the aquarium, get a tape measure or a ruler or whatever it is you have to use to measure with and figure out the exact inner width of the aquarium. Because with my baffles, let's say your tank is 11 and 3 16 wide inside. I will take an eighth of an, well, I'll take a quarter inch off of your number to where there's an eighth inch gap on the front and on the back so that the baffles do not press against the glass. Because if the acrylic is the exact width of the tank or worse is wedged because it's so big, once the water is in the sump, the acrylic will uh, expand slightly. It absorbs a little bit of water, like 3%, and it can crack the aquarium. And then you have a split sump. So I make the baffles to fit inside your aquarium so the inner measurement is very important. There's two ways of doing it. You can take a tape measure and be accurate, <laughs> which uh, I can do, but some people can't because the tape measure curls and they aren't really 100% sure of their width. The other choice is to take a ruler or you can do this with a tape measure too, and you put the tape in the tank and you extend as far as you can do. You know, like, let's say the tank is this wide. You put the tape measure in there. I just happen to have a tape measure. So here's our tank, it's this wide, okay? I put my tape measure in there and I push the little latch down to lock it. And it's lying in the tank, but there's more tank behind the body of the tape measure. And I see like right here, it says eight inches. And I put a little dot there with like a, a Sharpie or you can put a piece of masking tape there. That's eight inches. Then I will turn the tape around from the other side and whatever this distance is, I will add this to the eight inch. That's my true inner width of the aquarium. Now that you have the inner width, you know what size to make the baffles, a quarter inch less, or you can have a glass, fact, uh, glass manufacturer in your area, a glass uh, supplier, cut out these pieces of glass for you to have glass baffles, which will work even better. Glass definitely holds to glass with silicone. And you would definitely want to ask them to polish all the edges. And the reason they're going to do that is because you want to make sure that the glass is not sharp during the installation of gluing it, nor every single time you reach in the sump in the future. You want it to be beveled, so make sure you pay to have the edges polished. Um, finally, the glass should not be window pane glass that is too thin, that's eighth inch, and it will crack. The water pressure will bow it and it'll just snap. So you want to make sure that it is quarter inch thick. Um, if it's a bigger sump, you're going to go three eighths thick because you want to make sure that this glass can handle the, the water pressure. And then glue them, like I mentioned before, uh, the one inch apart, middle one off the bottom, an inch and a half high. And then regarding teeth, no glass supplier will be able to cut you teeth in your glass. There's no magic they can do. They can make you a few holes, but that's about it. What you would do in that case is you could take egg crate and you can cut it the exact width of your aquarium to where it fits in there nicely. And you can put a bead of silicone on there and you can, or a super glue gel would probably work too, and just glue it to the top of the baffle and that would keep the plants from the macroalgae of the refugium getting through and into the next zone. Just use the egg crate. So there you go. There's some tips on how you can do this yourself. Um, Testable says, can I use aquascaping scissors to cut out a Kenya tree? Yeah, you can. Uh, the scissors, razor blades, uh, X-Acto knives all work well for trimming out soft corals like that, <clears throat> like Kenya, leather, uh, even zinnia. But um, yeah, yes, <laughs> that's your answer. Yes, you can. When you're all done, rinse it really well. You might even want to pour rubbing alcohol over your tools so that it um, helps evaporate any water off the body of the tool. It avoids it from rusting. <laughs> G Wonk says, I'm sure you've answered this a hundred times, but why is a girl fish named Spock? Well, to be honest, when I saw the fish and I saw the Vulcan eyebrows, I said, that's Spock. And I assumed it was a boy. <laughs> and uh, then later on, I discovered that the, the Nassau tangs with the streamers coming off the tail, the top and the bottom are really long, like, like flags. That's a male. And mine doesn't have those streamers. I was like, oh, so Spock's a girl. I didn't know that. So Spock is a girl. <laughs> and that's why. 
Malcolm Reeve, thank you so much for the super chat. That was really nice. Wait, I can buy a coral from Cornbread for $1,700? Wait, I can't buy a coral from Cornbread for $1,700. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Aw, Eric sent a super chat for me to tell you guys. <laughs> I want to say thanks to everyone who sent messages with kind words. They are very appreciated. Yes, uh, the last live stream was the one where I dedicated it to Eric because he is dealing with some very bad cancer, and I wanted everyone to say things to him now while he's alive rather than say things about him after he's gone. So I know that's kind of dark, but I felt that way about Caitlin too. When Caitlin died, I was frustrated to see all these wonderful things being said about her, and I wish she could have seen every last one of those words. Trent says, sweet shirt. Yeah, I got this uh, from the dive shop. Let me show you the back. I don't know if, you can, if I can get tall enough here. But on the back should be all the different skills you can get from this dive shop. And uh, I've got a few of them. <laughs> They're like merit badges when it comes to scuba diving. Um, so this is the place where I got my education back in 2011, 2012. I save t-shirts forever. I'm, I'm, the, I'm a t-shirt hoarder, and I admit it. Let's see. Um, I didn't answer the rest of your question, though. I got distracted by T-shirts. Let's see. Um, so he says, I'm looking to build a nano tank. I'm looking at overflow boxes. What's your, good, your opinion on a good overflow box in a 20-gallon long? I've never had one that wasn't a bean animal. You know, there's a few brands. I feel like eShops was one that's pretty nice and sleek and thin. You need something small because it's a 20-gallon long. It's not much of an aquarium. There may be some people here that will put some comments. If not, ask in the uh, in Club Miller's Reef. Let me throw that on the screen. We haven't put that on here in forever. So Club Miller's Reef, oops, not bad. <laughs> Club Miller's Reef is a, a group on Facebook that I've been running. We just had our three-year anniversary a week ago. And uh, we have about 8,000, 9,000 members. And we answer your questions. And we put links to the things you're buying. So that helps also. So if you're not a member yet, feel free to join. I actually made that group specifically for you YouTube audience to talk with me daily so we could chat during the week and not have to wait for our Saturdays. But um, the group has done a really, oh, let's see. the group has done a really nice job <clears throat> uh, of self-regulating itself. We have a few moderators to make sure no one's mean. We literally have a rule against meanness. So if someone's mean, they get thrown out forever. So I always tell people, if you're having a bad day, do not come post in the group. There's no reason to do that. Go test your water. Go do some water testing. Go change your water. Go do something productive. Don't come in there looking to fight because you'll just lose your access to the club forever. But um, go in there and ask about overflow boxes. I'm sure someone's going to give you a great link. There's a couple more in my head that I can visualize, but I can't remember the brand. But I think you'll be able to find... I feel like eShops was the one. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> I guess that's Rogue Gaming says, what do you do about encrusting coral on a disc or a square where you can still see the shape of the frag mount it's grown on? That's as bad as a frag rack in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you. Those are not pleasant and uh, they're actually really weird looking. It's unfortunate that that happens and it's why I think some people like to take the corals off of the frag plug it's on and maybe put it on something more realistic. Um, there's not much you can do besides really modify it. Like, for example, I mean, you know, it's if it's a disc or a square, even if you put it through a saw, it's still like a supersized quarter covered in tissue <laughs> or um, an Oreo cookie or something. You know, it's just a weird shape. So you might be able to possibly lean that coral against some nearby rock work so that the coral starts growing up that and then get rid of that square, that circle, and just kind of make it go away or maybe you could do i mean you're still i mean if you could put it in a spot where it gets light but you can't see it like on the front of an overflow box and you glued it down low so the tissue is growing up the overflow and hiding all the black that'd be kind of nice but again depending on the angle and how you've got your aquascape you might see a big old stupid circle or square down low uh, that's that's the problem that's why i wouldn't want that in my tank because it looks so unnatural i i say this often nature in, does not 
have a straight lines. It's just not what it is. It's completely unnatural. And uh, so when we aquascape, I try very hard not to have like one straight line of rock. You know, I don't want to look like bricks are stacked. I want to look all uneven and, and highs and low points. You can kind of see in the background here, my aquascape is not all the exact same height intentionally. <clears throat> Looking for the next question. Lincoln says, I have a huge problem with freaking out and making over, uh, big overcorrections. <clears throat> Your daily diaries are a reminder to avoid that. Yeah, it really is. And uh, I kind of feel like the diary is going to be boring for like the next four or five days because what on earth <laughs> will I come up with to talk about now? But every day the tank needs something. So I believe I will have something to share. Um, I got to tell you, yesterday's parameters that I shared, they couldn't be more perfect. I'm actually very happy with them. I mean, I know to others, they're not perfect. But for my tank, those numbers are fantastic. I'll uh, review them with you here in case you didn't watch the diary last night. Um, and also, I, I measured everything. Even though I have a Trident and I have an Apex, I do like to double check my numbers. The one I have not double checked, and someone just asked me about it last night or this morning, was about pH. I'm going to pull the probes out, clean them. Maybe that'll be today's diary. See, I found something to talk about. <laughs> I'll clean the probes, I'll calibrate, and I'll put it back on the rack. Um, but the Trident measures alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. But I have an ELOS alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium test kit, test kits that uh, I use as well. And so when I look at the Trident, it gives me information, but I like to double check. And I don't expect them to match exactly. And I'm not really worrying about that, but it's nice to know the ballpark is close. And so um, <clears throat> alkalinity, according to my test kit, was 9.0. According to the Trident, it was 8.86, which is basically 8.9. So 8.9 to 9.0, we were really close. I'm, I'm fine with that. Calcium, my test kit said 430. The Trident said 457. I think it's a little bit lower. I think that that was like a hiccup in the graph because the tank probably just had some magnesium dosed. Magnesium chloride has some calcium in it, and so I think it can kind of throw off the reading a hair, you know, like 40 points. And then magnesium, the Trident says 1307 ppm. My test kit says like 1350. So I, I, I mentioned also that I'd like my magnesium to be a little bit higher in the tank, but then I also said, well, why with all my Montes gone, <laughs> do I even care? But uh, the Tierra del Fuego is still going, and uh, so it needs some magnesium. So I'd like that number. I like 1,400 for a magnesium in my tank. Okay. Then my other numbers, nitrate was 15. I took a picture to prove it. Um, phosphate's 0.25, which is relatively low. I mean, I know people like 0 0.03, but 0.25 is nothing to sweat. I'm actually fine with like 0.1. You know, if I had an ideal number, 0.1 is perfectly suited for my tank. 0.25 happens, 0.5 happens, 0.75 happens, 1.0 happens. Um, but I don't have like a green hair algae tank either. I just have a reef. Um, so I've never been scared of phosphate. Phosphate is one of those things that it went up and I knocked it down with phosphate Rex. And then over the next eight weeks it went up and I knocked it back down. And I've been doing that for a decade. But nitrate was the one that I was really concerned about and I finally got that under control. Uh, the other thing was that at the time of testing, last night was around 8.30 I think it was. My uh, pH was 8.36. My temperature was 78.6. My Salinity measured 35.8 on the uh, salinity probe. My refractometer said 1.026. And ORP was 278, which is uh, logical. My ORP gradually goes up more and more after the last water change. When you do a water change, it comes way down to like the low 200s, and then it slowly creeps up over time and then stays there you know, the longer I don't do a water change. So I was very happy with those numbers. <clears throat> Let me turn this off because it's on my face. And I might as well throw this on here because uh, that's not on my face. <laughs> so Mila's Reef uh, is how I make a living. And while a lot of you have been super patient with me um, when it came to acrylic orders, and I thank you for that, I am ramping up my production. I'm getting better at getting caught up with everyone. And there's a couple people I'm still needing to take care of. But other than that, I'm pushing out orders as quickly as I can out the door. So if you're buying something from my website, I really appreciate it. And listen. The web developers finally had time to work on my website, um, something I they told me they would do at the end of July. 
and this is mid-August, but they were working on it yesterday. And I think they fixed some stuff in the shipping module. So that will help. If you are a customer of mine, you know how I do this. You place an order and whatever it comes out to be, if the shipping is less, I send you a refund. I've been doing that for the last two years. Um, if the shipping isn't enough, I send you an email and say I need more money because <laughs> I just can't eat it. Um, but yesterday I discovered something that I never ever knew that they wanted to know. They would say, well, we need to know the box sizes. And I have probably 20 different size boxes, not including when I have to ship a sump and I have to build the box. So I've got all these different box sizes and that's in a very high um, demand to put on a website because most companies, like let's say somebody was selling necklaces. They have these cute little boxes with a little piece of cotton inside and they just need to ship a small box. And no matter what jewelry they have, it fits that box. So no big deal. Me, I have, you know, you guys want to buy some glue, small box. You want to buy a bottle, larger box. You want to buy Prodibio, wider box. You want to buy an RO system, big box. You want to buy, uh, you know, a peacemaker, a long box. There's so many size boxes. I, like I said, I probably have 20 different sizes. And they would tell me, well, we need to know the size and the weight. And so I said, okay, the RO system, it's 24 by 18 by 10, and it's 18 pounds. And he says, okay, and he put that in. And then, you know, when you would go to my website and you want to buy an RODI system, the uh, website would compute it, FedEx Ground is $81. I'm like, $81, that's not right. It's like between 17 and $24 maybe, maybe. And they were like, well, I mean, that's what FedEx gave us. So found out <laughs> what they meant by the weight of the box. They want to know what the actual box weighs. I've never weighed an empty box in my life. So I take my huge box, which is flat, you know, it's just because it's all folded up, you know. And I stand it on the scale with my fingers on each side so it won't fall over. And it's like one pound, 15.5 ounces. I'm like, okay, so it's a two pound box. So what was happening was the website was computing, you buy an RO system, my website says how big the item is and how much it weighs. And then they added it plus 18 pounds of box. <laughs> I was like, oh. Didn't know that's what you meant. So I'm hoping that these things will compute better. But even if they're wrong, you know, we'll work it out. You will not be ripped off. I'm not here to take advantage of anyone. And so when you buy things, just know I will do my best to get you the best rate I can. And uh, sometimes you, you will pick FedEx, but I find priority mail is cheaper and I will jump that way. And almost no one, I had like one guy get mad at me for that. He's like, I picked FedEx for a reason. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I was trying to save you money. And he's like, I never get my mail. I'm like, all right. And uh, that was the end of that. I just, you know, I mean, fortunately I didn't have like 50 people telling me that. If you absolutely want something a certain way, be sure you send me an email and tell me that. Like I need this to be mailed to a PO box or I need it to be the post office or I need it to be this, that. I understand if that's the case, you gotta tell me. But if I don't know, I'm just gonna try and find the best rate to save you money and refund the difference. Uh, HTC says, what kind of magnets can you use, if at all? Magnets for what? Like to make your own frag rack or what? I don't, I don't know where that came into the conversation. I don't sell any magnets. I don't shop for any magnets. Uh, the things I do sell that include a magnet in them are made by the manufacturer, whether it's a, a feeding clip from two little fishies, like this one here that I used to feed Spock and it holds the clip on the glass, or um, the cleaning magnets to clean the glass, like Flipper, I sell those. The Vortec pumps have magnets in them. I mean, there's things with magnets, but I've not tried to like make a frag rack with magnets. I, I don't even want to. Magnets are super expensive and they have to be completely sealed from salt water and they do not last. And so when, no matter what product you buy, if you look it up, there will be someone screaming bloody murder that they got this product and it's not even that old and the magnets split open and it's rusting and it's killing their reef, which I understand some damage happened because of the magnet. I don't know if you bought the thing brand new. I don't know if you bought it used. I don't know if you bought it last month or if you bought it last month plus a year, <laughs> which a lot of times we don't realize how long it's been. And uh, I've literally taken these clips I'm talking about, like the one I just showed you, and I, you know, people are like, oh, 
that's the exact one that hurt my reef. And so I had one that was two years old, and I carefully peeled it open, and I took the magnet out, and it was brand new, pristine, dry, not a drop of anything, no rust, no damage. And I was like, well, how come mine that's been sitting submerged in my tank for two years has had no problem, but yours did? Now, there's certain things that hobbyists do that can cause problems. Let me see if I can get this magnet to cooperate. Just a second here. I might need to use the other magnet to bring it here. The clip is holding onto the glass extra well today. Here, I'll do this. Excuse me, Spock. Ha, got it. <laughs> okay, so uh, some people will have the outside part and they'll have the inside part in their hands at the same time. And click, it goes together. And then I think what they do is they pull it apart. And when they pull it apart, let me turn off that thing on the screen. They actually break the seal. And now the seal is leaking salt water in and the magnet is getting wet. So if you have two magnets come together accidentally, whether it's a cleaning magnet or a frag rack or a, a feeding clip, you want to slide them sideways apart, not pull. Because when you pull, you break the seal. And it's not like you can just pull and put some glue and fix the seal because you may not see that you've created a hairline crack where the, the magnet was sealed inside. So just keep that in mind. Um, the Musical Reef says, all my SPS, my Zoas, and my Zinnia have been closed at night, right when the lights go out. They'll stay open the first three days from the local fish store, but then they stay closed. I don't see any pests. Is that bad? I mean, some corals do close at night, and they're open during the daytime. I guess what we need to do is look at your tank at many different times of the day, or stick, I don't know, some kind of camera in front of your tank with time lapse to where you can actually track what's happening. You may even discover that you've got a fish in the tank nipping. It could be something in your water parameters are not ideal and it's making things close up. I'm not positive. I mean, you said things were open for a few days and then they're closed. So let's try and figure out the culprit. Another choice uh, that also works, a lot of times we don't think to do it, turn off all the lights in the room, but leave the tank you know, in its normal schedule, its normal lighting, and stand you know, 15 feet away and just watch the tank Try to be invisible, okay? And just watch the tank and just see what it does for like 10 minutes with you not near it. And you may discover there's some fish that is constantly nipping at, 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 a, at a certain coral. And that is why the coral's not doing well. It may not be that there's a problem with the parameters, problem with the coral, problem with the pest. It could literally be a fish that swims by and goes nip, swims away and comes back nip, nip, swims away, comes back nip, nip, nip. And that could be what's happening. There was a coral I bought from the fish store. It was a really pretty German blue Montipora digitata. And I was like, oh my God, I need that coral. And I came home and I planted on my rock work and it was so pretty. And I'm like this on the glass, like, oh, it was so nice. And three days later I had, a, or two days later, it was bone white, it was just dead. And I was so mad, I went back to the fish store and I was like, you sold me a bad coral. <laughs> that tells you how long ago this was. I was mad at the store owner he sold me a bad coral, like it was a setup, a ticking time bomb. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, I bought this coral from you, it cost me a lot of money, and it's dead, and I want another one. God, I can't believe I even said all these things. That's crazy. But anyway, I did. This really happened. And uh, he uh, said, all right, I'm going to give you one more, but I'm never doing this again. I was like, okay, we're good. <laughs> and I came home, and I put it where the other one was. And then I'm, I stood back and I'm looking at the tank and I watched my flame angel go right up to it, go pow, 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 pow. And it was like eating every polyp off. I was like, oh, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a bad coral. I've got a bad fish. This is my fault. And I may have even gone back to his store and apologized to him. There's a possibility I did that. Uh, I'm not sure, but I have a feeling I did admit to him that it wasn't the coral, it was my fish. And it told me I couldn't buy that type of coral anymore because of the coral beauty. Uh, the flame angel I had. But yeah, I remember that happening. So it could be you have something nipping at these corals. It could be something with your water is not great. It could be your tank temperature is not great. It's getting too warm. It could just be the time of day and things are closing down because that's what they do. But if they're staying closed all the time, and you said 
SPS, and ZOAs, and Zinnia. That's a lot. And Zinnia is like the tank barometer coral for me. If you put Zinnia in your tank and it's always happy and suddenly it closes, that told me from across the room alkalinity was wrong and I had to make a correction. It could be that you're using pH buffer because you feel pH is super important and you keep adding it and adding it and adding because you're trying to be 8.3 and you're trying to be 8.3 and you're doing that every single day and it seems like, oh my God, it's down again. I got to put some more in. You actually are shooting your alkalinity crazy high and your Xenia just closes up and won't open and possibly even melts away. So you do want to find out what your water parameters are. You want to measure alkalinity, calcium. I mean, the whole thing I just talked about 20 minutes ago, all those parameters matter. If you're running a reef, you need to know all of them. It's not good enough to just know ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and, and uh, whatever's in the master kit. Phosphate? I don't know. It, it's got to be everything. It could even be your salinity is off. Like, for example, I mean, I don't know anything about your experience. I don't know if you've been doing this 20 years or if this is your first year. But, for example, some people make the mistake of when their tank is evaporating water, they pour in more salt water because it's a saltwater reef. And it makes the salinity higher and higher, which closes up zoanthids and closes up zinnia and closes up SPS corals. So it could be any of these things that I'm talking about. I, I don't have enough information to, to help, help you. So when you say, is this bad? It kind of sounds bad. Uh, you need to find out what's going on. Oh, oh no. Wildcat says, my Hydra 32 mount gave out last night and fell into the tank. I unplugged it, took it apart, wiped it with RO, wetted rag, and now it's sitting in rice. Would you use it again? Um, you took it all apart and you've checked it. So I was thinking you lost the reef too, like it got electrocuted. Um, you may want to do the thing where you pour rubbing alcohol inside the innards because that will clean off any salt water damage off all the electronics. I know it sounds insane and you can Google this, but apparently you can just pour rubbing alcohol all over electronics and it will just like push the water away and it evaporates super fast and then you know doing the rice thing or whatever that's fine too but this is an actual real thing and I, I mean I remember trying to fix something it was the the uh, Eheim auto feeder the whole thing fell in well Spock pulled the whole thing into the tank and it was still spinning as it was falling to the bottom of the reef and food went everywhere like New Year's Eve uh, confetti <laughs> I was just like Oh my God. And I took it out and of course the batteries, I took them out immediately and I saw the little circuit board and I saw the little motor and the wires and I thought, so I just drowned it in rubbing alcohol and uh, I let it dry out for, I don't know, like a day or two or three or something. It wasn't very long, but within a couple of days I put batteries in it and it came on and I could see the display and I was able to program it again with a new code and, uh, I ended up using it for like six or nine more months before it did just die. And I'm assuming I didn't quite get something completely clean, something that was deep inside the motor that I didn't you know, flush properly. Some salt damage before I got it. So can your light still be salvaged? Maybe. Um, you could also contact AI through Ecotech and see if they have any advice or if they'd offer, like on your own, if you took your money to ship it to them and have them repair it, it might be a thing. Um, but yeah, you're off to a good start. The rice was a good idea and you tried to clean it, but you may need to do the rubbing alcohol thing. Uh, Steve says, what's the best way to glue a Montipora Capricornus to the reef? Cut off the plug or leave it on? You know what's kind of fun? Is when you have a small frag of something like a Monty, and it's on a frag plug and you plant it on there and then the coral becomes this giant thing and then one day you remove it and you see the little frag plug at the end. I kind of like that. <laughs> so am I telling you keep the frag plug so you can have this weird experience three years from now? No, but uh, if you don't need the frag plug and you want to remove it carefully from the coral, you can. You can apply some glue where that frag plug was and glue it to a spot in your tank on the rock work. I usually recommend putting it down low because it will grow out like a plate and if you put it up high, which looks cool, it grows bigger and bigger and creates this giant shadow underneath and everything underneath is starving for light. And plus, if it's whirling, you know, it caps outwards, but it kind of curls and curls. You can't really see the whirling unless you're above the tank looking down. So if you put it down low and it's doing that, you get to appreciate and enjoy it. You could even kind of tilt it slightly, but it may kind of self-level as it grows and become, you know, it could whirl like a rose and be really pretty, but I do recommend gluing it down low. 
So frag plug or not, that's up to you. Steve says, I hear ick can come into a tank as frag hitchhikers. Is that true? Normally not. Uh, a lot of times the fish that have ick came from fish only systems. You know, the fish store doesn't usually put the corals with the fish they sell. So, but again, if you're getting frags from any hobbyist, that person could have an infestation in their tank. But we dip the coral. I don't believe any part of the ick cycle holds onto a coral could be dwelling on the frag plug. But if you're dipping the coral for 10 or 15 minutes and then you're brushing it and all that and putting the tank, I wouldn't, I've never put in frags from any of my tanks and suddenly had ick in my tank. So my, my, my gut is telling me to tell you that's not a thing to worry about. But if you just take something out of somebody's tank, just put it in your tank and your hand's soaking wet from their water into your water and their, the net went into their tank and went into your tank and the whole thing, yeah, you could transfer. It's possible for ick to migrate. Um, Foreign Reefer says, since we're talking about pests, do you think wrasses or banded shrimp would eat Aptasia eating nudibranchs? I suspe suspect that's what's happening in my tank, but most of the info proves me wrong. Okay, so you have nudibranchs that eat Aptasia, and now you want something to eat the nudibranchs? Why? <laughs> oh, maybe you're worried you lost them, like you bought some and they vanished? Is it possible that wrasses or a coral band shrimp would eat them? Uh, it's possible, yeah. Normally, what happens with people that want to have Aptasia eating nudibranchs in their tank is they put in the parents, and then the parents make babies, and the babies are super active and they go eat the Aptasia. And it's like two or three or four generations of these tiny nudibranchs you never see devour all the Aptasia. That's kind of how I've understood it to be. Uh, I know sometimes people will put the nudibranchs in a separate tank and they will move the thing with Aptasia into the tank, let them eat it all, take the clean thing, put it back in the tank and get the next one. And they rotate through and that way the nudibranchs stay in their little system and they're constantly being fed and you are slowly but surely cleaning off every piece of rock or coral in your tank until there's absolutely no Aptasia left. It's kind of a tedious process. But I don't know for sure that something in your tank would eat them intentionally, but I can't rule it out. I mean, fish don't always read the books we read. Coral Vid says, these are the answers that work. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I should use that mug today. By the way, I have those mugs in stock. Uh, just so you know, if you're trying to buy it in the US, it's the mug plus shipping is $24. And uh, I pack them extra well. And I've had a few of those mugs show up as pictures in Club Miller's Reef. And each one's getting there without damage. I'm so happy about that. I carefully wrapped them in bubble wrap. I put them in a box that's even bigger. And I put peanuts around that and I pack it to where when you hold the box and you shake it, there's zero movement. It's like, I hear nothing. Okay, good. And I put my label on there and I ship it to you. So if you're wanting a Miller's Reef mug that says answers that work, they are in stock and I only have like a hundred left. So <laughs> hurry, buy one today. And they are on the website. And if you're looking for them and you can't find them in the shop area, there's a search bar. You just type in the mug and boom, it'll give you right to where it is or you can look under reef wares. It's in the same section where the t-shirts are. Um, <laughs> so, okay, hang on, let me go back to this because this is funny. Annie says, I keep four chocolates in the sump for rotation. I'm assuming these are chocolate starfish that are for the uh, harlequin shrimp that she is giving them a meal to snack on and she's rotating them through as they get one arm at a time. That's my assumption. But Rob, his reply was Godiva. <laughs> I had to share that. That's funny. All right. So problem, problem prone says my tank is about nine months old. 
and I just had my first few patches of hair algae show up. Should I let it run its course or take some kind of action? Do not let it run its course because its course is to grow everywhere. And you do not want green hair algae in your tank at all. I have a little tiny patch show up in the frag system that went through hell lately. And uh, I just reached in, started plucking it off and removing it from the system. You do not want hair algae to take hold in your tank. You definitely want to handle it. My method has been the same forever. It's, it's the same advice I gave in the video that I posted, what, five years ago? You can turn off the flow in the tank. You read, oh no, actually. You treat the tank to remove phosphate first. So I use phosphate RX, I put in the right amount, I let it kill the phosphate in the water. And by, by kill, it turns the phosphate into a solid, like flakes, very small flakes. They don't look like flakes, but they're flakes, okay? Um, and the flakes will be exported either into a very fine mesh filter sock, or they will be pulled out through your protein skimmer because it's a flocculant. It turns the liquid phosphate into a solid so it can be exported. And then three days later, your algae is weaker. It doesn't even know why, it's because it has no phosphate and the plant is doing worse. At this point, you can turn off the flow in your tank, reach in with your hand, grab a pinch, pull it off, put your hand in a bowl of water, rinse your fingers off, put your hand back in, grab a pinch, rinse your fingers, put your hand in there over and over until you can't stand it and then do it again tomorrow and do it again the day after that until you've gotten rid of as much as you possibly could do it yourself. At that point, add a cleanup crew, which is gonna be a bunch of snails and hermit crabs and let them eat the last of it. And that'll be it, it'll be gone and it'll never come back, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so yeah, don't let it run its course because hair algae does not, its course is to live. Cody says, why do my rainbow bubble tips thrive while my green bubble tip has bleached and just doesn't do well overall? It could be that there's a problem between those two types of anemones in the same tank and there's a chemical warfare going on. It could be that, that green bubble tip is in an area where it's getting way too much light, but it's probably a conflict between the anemones. Because for example, People would take, they like, oh, I love all the anemones. And they get a Colorado Sunburst, and they get a Black Widow, and they get a Sherman Rose, and they get a green bubble tip, and they get this. And only certain ones live, and certain ones do really poorly. They can't all be in the same body of water. So usually I just say, pick the one you like and enjoy it. And so my anemone cube has three types of bubble tips in there, and they all live together, and harmonious is the best I can say as a description, it's working. And someone said, why wouldn't you add this or add that? I said, because this is working. I don't want to mess with success. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. I appreciate that. It does go only one way. And by the way, Dwayne, if you're watching this, you put it on backwards when you came here to help me with my tank. And I'm sure it's because you have cats, but this house has no cats. So please never do that again. I'm so far behind in the chat. I'm reading these comments of things I talked about 30 minutes ago. I'm like, oh my God. All right, let's see what else we got here. Oh, you know what? I guess today's a good day to do this. We're not on Instagram, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, that has nothing to do with anything. I am sitting on a pile of t-shirts that I printed more than a decade ago that I want to give away. There are different sizes. And I don't even know what they are. I have to look. But there's a caveat. For you to get this free t-shirt from me, you have to be banned from Reef Central. <laughs> so if you have been banned from Reef Central and you're the right size, you could possibly get a free shirt from me. Or maybe I'll make you pay the shipping. I don't know. But uh, I want these shirts out of my closet. They've been sitting there forever. I'm not gonna sell them. I just wanna give them away. But I want them to go to the right people. There's no reason to wear a shirt that says, I got banned from Reef Central on the front if you weren't from that website. People are like, why, what is that? And you're like, I don't know, Mark gave it to me. It's stupid. So if you want one of these cool shirts, <laughs> I'm gonna have to know your size, obviously. I need to look it up. Okay, so we'll plan on that. That's, it's in the works. You now, I've put this, I've put this uh, idea in your head. There's a chance you could get a free shirt. And um, I guess I will let you know somehow uh, maybe in the community tab of this YouTube channel, 
I'll put a post up and uh, you could get a shirt. So they're a blue shirt. They say, I got banned from Reef Central. And on the back, it says, Milev made me do it. And it's a joke. And it's something I did a long time ago and they got really mad at me for doing that. And so I'm not selling them. <laughs> but uh, I mean, at this point, I don't think it would matter if I, if I sold 16 or 20 shirts, but whatever. I just want them out of the closet. But there's, again, it has to make sense and it has to be your size. If it's not either one of those two things, it's pointless. And I'm not just going to send it out to someone just because. So um, we'll, we'll figure that out. It's, it's on my, my to-do list of things to get done because I am still decluttering this house. Uh, Marcus, I don't know if you made a mistake or if I made a mistake, but if you want to order another shirt, yes, please do. <laughs> uh, it is possible I made a mistake. You know, I saw what I thought you ordered, um, and then I type it into my deal, and then I forward that to the t-shirt vendor because the t-shirts are sold from, uh, I'm a reefer, and through Carolina Aquatics, and then I um, send you the other stuff, like you bought the mug. But maybe I sent you the wrong one. Maybe it was a mistake. Uh, Dan says, I have a bryopsis problem and I raised my magnesium to around 1500. It's been there for a week and the bryopsis is getting thicker. Will it magically disappear if I wait longer or try something else? You're going to have to try something else. Uh, it's not magnesium that gets rid of it. That was something. Let me tell you the backstory. So back in the day, bryopsis was taking over our reef tanks. It was a, a real problem. It was way worse than hair algae. And one person discovered if they dosed Kent Tech M, which was their version of magnesium, it was a liquid, you poured it in the tank. If you raised that brand of magnesium to 1600 in your tank and kept it there for three weeks, the bryopsis would die off. So everyone, of course, went and bought magnesium and said it doesn't work. It had to be Kent Tech M. And if you didn't get that, it wouldn't work. And I remember, hundreds of threads. I raised my magnesium, it's not happening. And I'm like, you didn't use the right product. Well, they said use magnesium. I'm like, they said use Kent Tech M. Well, in the meantime, Kent Tech M doesn't use the same product inside of it. Whatever it is, it's not, it doesn't have it. Uh, I thought maybe, matter of fact, there may be a product from the brand Continuum that is a bryopsis killer in a bottle that is probably <laughs> Tech M under another name. So there's a chance that would work. Um, lettuce nudibranchs eat bryopsis. Uh, peroxide kills bryopsis, but not much else. <laughs> oh, um, you know what might work? Flux RX might work. Flux RX gets rid of green hair algae and I think it gets rid of bryopsis. So you have a few choices of work, but just regular magnesium won't do it. Uh, Derek says, I was wondering if you could make black acrylic tank dividers with slots for water flow using suction cup divider clips. I'll give you the dimensions and, and mail you some example clips. Um, yeah, it's possible. Maybe. Uh, you can send it over. I'll take a look. Uh, I'm not a big fan on uh, suction cup anything, but I actually have a box full of unwanted suction cups. <laughs> so who knows? Maybe we can do something. Stability Reef says, can you explain how you maintain your healthy refugium? Well, I leave it alone. It has nine hours of light per day. It's um, got very slow flow going through it, which is something I've recommended forever. A lot. So in the old days, people would get a sump. They got the Berlin style and the water poured in, went zone, 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 out. And water would just shoot through the refugium and I always said, that's not good for refugium growth. Now, there is a caveat, like Ketomorpha likes higher flow. <clears throat> but 
I just found that light did not penetrate the water properly when it was just cascading like the white water rapids. And I've always recommend slow flow through the refugium. You don't end up with bubbles. You have good algae growth and it continues to be true. This refugium here is, uh, I, th That's okay. Hang on just one sec. Just a sec. Type in there. Okay, bye. Okay. Testing, testing. I think we're back. So guys, sorry about that. The um, batteries died on this uh, receiver or this transmitter. So I have to know how much of what you didn't hear. <laughs> I was talking about refugiums. Did you get any of the refugium stuff or no? Because I can go back to that. I'm glad you can hear again. I apologize, guys. You know what I do? I, I look down at this from time to time. See, like right now it's flashing red and green. And uh, when I was looking at it before, it was green. But eventually those two Duracells just give up. So because I have a backup, I just switched. Now the volume might be louder or l less loud because of the way the gain is dialed into this one. Hopefully it's okay. Did you guys hear anything about the refugium or do I need to go back to that? Cause he asked me, how do you grow your refugium? Spontaneous hearing loss is real. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm just waiting. You, the beginning. All right, good. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. All right, so I'm going to go back to talking about the refugium. Scrolling back up. Oh, I see so much I need to cover. This live stream is never going to end. I thought this would be a quick live stream today. Stability Reef said, could you explain how you maintain your healthy refugium? So I have been recommending for a very long time to have slow flow through the refugium. I find that light penetrates better. There's no micro bubbles in there. Uh, the plants grow well. And, I, and so that's what mine is. I set up this new sump under my tank about three years ago. I built a new one and replaced the old one. So the refugium is about three years old. And in that time, I uh, removed the sand and I put in reborn calcium reactor media instead, the large nuggets, because I thought it was pretty and allowed the plants to adhere to it, to hold on and grow. And, <clears throat> and it also allows me to like push everything over to the side and vacuum out detritus 
from between the, uh, the nuggets of media a couple times a year. The uh, lights on that tank or on that area run nine hours a day, and that works really well for my macroalgae. <clears throat> I don't dose iron or anything else like that. <clears throat> My tank just always has the right amount. And I think that's because I dose Prodivio every 15 days and it must be in those elements plus the salt brand I use for the water changes that I do. It, when I do the ICP test, I never come back with you're low on this or that or the other. Just, those numbers are always right and they're always within range of Fiji, which is, I, I like to compare my water to Fiji's water. The uh, Funny thing, a little <clears throat> side thing, I always look at lanthanum because I'm a big phosphate RX user and my lanthanum number is always super low. It never comes back high and you would totally think I would deserve to have this crazy, horrible high reading in my tank, but my, my method of exporting must be great because I've never had lanthanum buildup in my system and you know the tank has been around for so many years. But other than that, that's about it. You may need more higher flow in your refugium if you're growing ketomorpha because it seems to do better in that environment. But for the most part, I recommend slow flow through there. Also, um, you want to make sure there's enough macroalgae in there to do something. If you have this big area and there's one little ball, it's going to take forever. You need to have like a bunch of pieces or, or separate it and spread it out so that it can all grow and fill in so your fusion can do its job. And the whole put 24 hours of light on there is a terrible idea. That is not how things work in nature. That's not how it works on planet Earth. So limit your time. Don't, don't do the 24 hour thing. And I know some people are like, oh, I like the pink. That's the proven method. Somewhere between <clears throat> 5100 and 6500 Kelvin is a, a really sweet spot. It's in the yellow spectrum, uh, daylight, and uh, it, the plants grow. So that's my talks, my comments on refugium growth. Uh oh, I hear Jack. Jack says, do you make sumps what size? I make a number of different sizes. They're available on the website for some examples, but <coughs> Usually they're custom made to fit your aquarium. And then they have to be something I can ship safely or I don't do it. I'm sorry, guys. Two times in the same show? Crazy. Uh, I think we'll be okay this time. I was looking down. It was blinking red and green and then off. I was like, oh, no, I lost it. So who knows what you didn't get. Whatever you missed, that's it. You read my lips. That's all I can tell you. But I was saying that Terry said she got banned, or he. I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman. Uh, got banned for mentioning my name. <laughs> So Reef Keeper says, tell us the story. Why were you banned from Reef Central? Uh, actually, it was a really dumb reason. I got banned from Reef Central for making an April Fool's Day joke on my own website. And I just uh, spent time for like a week before the event to, uh, to make it look like I got a ton of money. And I took pictures of me in front of a lot of expensive stuff. And then on April Fool's Day, I released this article right at midnight. And I said that Reef Central had chosen to purchase Reef Addicts, which was my website, 
and it was going to be Reef Addict Central from now on, and the podcast was going to be uh, all about the threads. You would no longer have to go to Reef Central to read, you could just listen to the podcast. And then I actually made a podcast where I was just reading the thread with all the comments and I would say what the person, you know, the person's name, what they said, and then I would identify the emoticon they used and I went to the reply and what they said. And, you know, then I went to the next, and it, it went on, it was so monotone and so boring and so terrible. And I did this for like 45 or 52 minutes. And even as I did it, the longer the podcast went, the more I was losing my voice because I needed a drink of water, but I was allowing it to like dry out my vocal cords. It was really, really funny. And, uh, but anyway, the article showed this, this nice, nice Texas house. And I was in front of it and I had a for sale sign. I said, yeah, I'm selling this old house because I'm getting this one. And it was this monster house. It was so fantastic. It was so big that you couldn't get the whole house in the frame. <laughs> And I uh, went to Guitar Center and bought a really expensive guitar. So I was there with a the guitar. And I went into a Starbucks and got a picture and said, and I bought a Starbucks because that way I get free Wi-Fi so I can serve Reef Central for free and always have a free cup of coffee when I do it because now I own my own Starbucks. And I got a, a jet ski and I got a $80,000 car, which back then was a lot of money. <laughs> Nowadays, that's like a regular car. And uh, I, I had pictures of me with all these things. And people were reading, and they're like, I can't tell this is an April Fool's Day story. And then others were like, oh my God, I think this actually happened. And people were like, congratulations. And it was so funny. And I didn't even post it anywhere else. I didn't like put a link to my joke on Reef Central. But they heard about it, and they banned me. And they banned Jesse, my best friend, on the spot just for knowing me. <laughs> She had nothing to do with it. And she and I both got banned, and I never looked back. And that was back in 2010. And uh, there's actually no reason for me to ever go back to that site because the rules are that you have to post on their website, which I've been doing forever. I was like the third most prolific poster on that forum. Back in those days, I lived on Reef Central, and I would constantly answer questions and help people. And I would link them to articles on my website and link them to my Critter ID and link them to uh, whatever. But I knew that you had to be really careful because if you were selling from your website, that you had to pay for sponsorship. And so I was always very cautious with that. <clears throat> but they, uh, they kept saying, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I was like, okay, well, can I do this? You know, And it just was this ongoing thing of where no matter what I was doing, there'd be some vendor be upset. Well, why do you let Mark do that? And so they were, you know, their patience was running out. And I knew if I ever went back to Reef Central as a user, I would want to link them to my article about nitrate, link them to my article about photography, link them to my article about uh, dipping corals or whatever it is. And they would not allow it. I would constantly get in trouble for sharing a link to my website because my website's filled with things I sell. So I, that's why I've never gone back. There was absolutely no reason. And there was no way I was gonna like take my articles off my website and paste them onto Reef Central just so they could have the content. So that's why I've been banned and never tried to go back. Plus they said at the time, lifetime ban. So I'm assuming it's still in effect forever. Um, we still have sound. <laughs> the uh, fluconazole will help with bryopsis, yes. And then Brother Gas said, when you pick the bryopsis, siphon out at the same time and use some two-part epoxy to cover the area. You could, you could do that to kind of like just smother it. Uh, another thing you can do, like if the bryopsis is growing way up high in the tank, like where the overflow box teeth are, and like let's say it's in the teeth and you're having a hard time. I've actually in the past would lower the water line in my tank a few inches do a water change, and I put peroxide on the bryopsis and wait three to five minutes. And then I would, you know, peel off what I could, and then I'd fill the tank up with water again and let it resume. And like I said, in about three days, it would turn white because the, the uh, peroxide killed the bryopsis. Uh, Shane says, why do my bubble tip anemones always starve, lose their tentacles, and die? It's too vague to answer that question, but it could even be something as simple as your clownfish is too aggressive and is ripping the tentacles off the anemone. 
Like for example, you might have a bubble tip with a maroon clownfish. And maroon clownfish are really hard on bubble tips. And if the clown's big and the anemone's small, that anemone already has no chance of survival. I've seen that some vendors sell very, very small anemones and, uh, you know, and you guys buy them. <laughs> and I'm just like, what's going on? I mean, we used to buy something, you know, nice and you'd see your clownfish go into it and vanish. And, you know, to get a little tiny one and hope clowns will be in it is a terrible plan. So there is a chance that it's being torn up. It could be something's not right with your water quality. I do have a video specifically on this channel called uh, Bubble Tip Anemone Care or BTA Care. If you'd watch that, it covers everything in about whatever that is, 14 minutes long. And maybe there's something in there that will uh, make sense with your tank. You're like, ah, I haven't done this or I need to do this. And you can solve it. And then there's the whole section. Did we lose sound? Skip, skip, skip. <laughs> oh, I'm so bad about the sound thing. So annoying when that happens. All right, let's see. You know, with the amount of gesturing that I do when I talk, I should be doing sign language through these things. I need to learn that. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm half Swiss, but you would think I'm half Italian with how much I move my hands around. Uh, Aaron says, what's the difference between deep water SPS and shallow water? Uh, deep water or usually smooth-skinned Acropora, um, they're, they do better lower in the tank, even though our tank is only... 24 to 30 inches tall um, but they have a different look to their their sclerites I think it's called the way the polyps are arranged on the body um, deep water acros used to cost more than regular acropora but other than that not a lot of big differences and it is nice to have a little bit of deep water in there with your regular ones just because they look so different I actually like them a lot don't have much more to say about that Ah, thank you, Terry. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Now I know. I've always wondered. Those are those things you just, you're not sure, and you're like, hmm. Then you just kind of guess. By the way, if you want to find that April Fool's Day story, just go into Google and type April Fool's Milev Reef Addicts, and you'll find the whole story, and you can read it and see all the pictures. It was, it was really funny. And I was surprised that I got banned for it because the two years prior... Reef Central was doing an April Fool's Day joke. Uh, one year they called themselves Wreath Central and they changed their logo to be a big wreath like Christmas. And anywhere in the website where you typed certain keywords, it would swap them out. And so when you tried to read anything on that day, it was, it was funny or it was frustrating. For example, you could say, I just adjusted the pH level in my Yule log and I can't seem to get my alkalinity where it needs to be because they changed anywhere the word calcium reactor appeared, it said Yule log. And uh, they had stuff where it said, you know, I, I just trimmed my, and people probably said refugium, and it said Christmas tree <laughs> or whatever. And there was all these words that they messed up and it was really, really funny. And so that April Fool's Day, was, I enjoyed the heck out of it. And then the next year, they went from wreath central to beef central. And now it was all about hamburger and uh, cow meat. And, uh, and, you know, maybe it said, you know, I adjusted the pH in my udders <laughs> or whatever. It was, it was really, really funny. So when I was coming up with my April Fool's Day joke, I didn't tell anyone because it was a, you know, that's the whole point. You want to surprise people. And uh, so I didn't expect them to be mad at me, especially when I did it on my own website. But it is what it is. Terry says, I had 43,217 posts in Reef Central. Yeah, there was only two people ahead of me at that time. Ron Shemek was one who answered everything about Creature ID. That guy is a wizard, scientific wizard. 
he talked a lot about deep sand beds. He talked a lot about worms. That was his strength with bristle worms and fire worms and everything in between. But he knew a lot of creatures. I remember one time we flew him in to speak for our club. And uh, how did that work out? I mean, he, he spoke. I'm just trying to remember how it played out because I remember one time I was speaking and he was in my audience. And I'm like, holy crap, Ron Shemek is in my audience? You know, I'm the one speaking? And I think I was talking about creatures and I, was, and I got super self-conscious and I would say things like, well, uh, this right here is a digitate hydroid and I consider it to be a, a, nothing to worry about. But as Ron, who's here, might tell you, they are a problem and can sting your corals. <laughs> and he would just kind of nod like, yup. And I was like, but I had it in my tank and I thought it was really neat. And I took some pictures and made an animated GIF out of how it looked. But uh, yeah, I didn't find it to be a problem at all in your tank. And if you had one, so what? But yeah, that was, it's kind of funny how when you go to hear these speakers give their talks at MACNA, and then one day you're speaking at MACNA and they're in your audience, you're like, wow, that guy was talking about this and this guy did, and I've had people come up after my talk and like, I remember Dana Riddle came up after one of my talks and I was, uh, and I remember the first time I heard him speak and he was just so nice. He's like, man, I really enjoyed your talk. And I was like, wow, thanks. Because I was in your audience, you know, 10 years ago. So those are some fun experiences. But yeah, Ron was like, him and Randy Holmes Farley, I think were the two that posted their numbers were higher than me and I couldn't catch up. I wanted to beat them. <laughs> but I mean, even though I wanted to beat them, I didn't do something like go into every thread on Reef Central and, and just put the comment, nice, 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 nice. Like some people do to get their, their numbers up. I would answer questions and my numbers would just grow. And I never try to like cheat the system to like get a better number. Because I, I know people have done that. They'll just go into a thread and, and they want to get established. And one of the reasons they were doing the stupid nice thing, and that's not me just making up a word. That literally is what they would do. Reef Center had this rule back in the day that you had to spend, or you had to post a hundred times before you could sell in the for sale forum. And so they would go to any thread and it had a picture of a coral, it had a picture of a tank, it had a picture of a sump. They're like, nice. And they go to another thread, nice, nice, nice. And then as soon as they hit a hundred, I'm selling such and such, you know, and they were, they put their for sale ad up. And you, I remember that it was really irritating. And I was part of a group called Team RC. And, you know, we would watch for these guys that would post nice 15 times in a row. And then we'd let the moderators know and they'd delete like nine of them. <laughs> so they'd have, they're, they're, they're trying to get to 100 and the moderator would pull out a bunch. And it was funny. I don't know, whatever. Maybe it was mean, but they were just so determined to show up on a website brand new and they wanted to sell. And the whole point of that website at the time was to educate. And the for sale area was a benefit. It was a perk. And people just wanted to use it to you know, either make money or unload stuff they didn't want. And so the whole nice thing got uh, abused. And uh, I never was like that. So like I said, even though I had 43,000 plus posts, it wasn't a whole bunch of, that's cool, nice, neat, okay, sure, huh? You know, because those are such fake answers. It drives me crazy. I hate one word answers to stuff. And it was one of the things, it's actually one of the rules in Club Milo's Reef when people say, oh my God, I've got this problem in my tank, what do I do? And then you see someone put a two word answer, it drives me crazy. They're like, I have been doing such and such. They write this whole paragraph, they include three pictures, they explain their frustration, and they really want real legitimate advice. And the person just comes back, get me clean. It's like, okay, thank you. I guess I'll go Google what chemi clean is, and then I'll have to learn how to use it. And then is there anything I need to worry about? I mean. Give me more than two words. And you know, I used to put some comments where I'd say, I highly recommend ChemiClean and I recommend you use it this way. And these are things you need to consider, but this is why it's so good. And they'd have a solid answer and they're like, thanks Mark. And they'd go off and do it and they'd be happy. And <laughs> when people are like, FluxRx, ChemiClean, Skimmer. It's like, you're not being helpful. You're, you're, you're dropping like a breadcrumb of information, it's ridiculous. So help people. Oh, nice, I put the uh, link to the April Fool's Day article. Let's see, what else did I miss? Hey, man, that's really nice of you. Uptown Reefer said, or Uptown Reef Keeper said, 
you're a boss, <laughs> like a boss. He said, thanks for everything you do for the reefing community. You know, I actually enjoy our conversations because I do feel like I'm helping a lot of people, even if I don't get to see the results necessarily. But lately, some of you have been posting some really nice pictures and videos of your tank in Club Miller's Reef, and I'm really enjoying that. And by the way, if you aren't, please tag me in those posts. I know the moderators sometimes do. They'll bring it to my attention because I don't just sit there looking at everything new. I'm usually answering questions. So uh, if you post something of your tank and you're like, you know, I, I had a few people do this, like, hey, Mark, you asked for this, so here you go. And I really enjoyed that. So if you're doing that, please keep it up. I, I love that. I like seeing your tanks too. Paul, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> Is she really? You know, let me do that. Let me get some nori. So because of all the tangs in my tank, I um, was using a full sheet of nori. This is a half a sheet. And I reduced it because the purple tang was a big eater of this algae. And I don't want to over feed the tank now. So in case you don't know about nori, I like to leave the package open so it gets humid and uh, it gets a, a little softer so it's not so brittle. And I like to fold it. Usually I fold it and I fold it, but since I only have half a sheet, just one fold. And I like to roll it up and fold it in half and this will go in the feeding clip. And I grab the clip and I squeeze it to pinch it on and then I put it on the glass. So let's, uh, let's see if this thing will cooperate. Okay, good, it's sliding. It was holding on to the glass before, I didn't want to budge. I know Spock, hang on. She's all excited. All right. There you go. So now Spock can get a meal. Here, I'll scoot over so you can watch. Nope, this way, this way. Got to be the right spot. <laughs> you guys saved her life. If it wasn't for you, she'd never get another meal. So the yellow tang is Frick. Um, that's her name. His name. His name. It's a boy. And uh, I had two at one point, and they fought all the time, so they were Frick and Frack, which are actually uh, a couple characters from a German cartoon, as far as I recall. And uh, when Frack one day died, I was down to just Frick. I did not... Uh, name the coal so at some point i guess it deserves a name but uh i've been watching the coal and so you've known this because you see the videos especially on close-up the coal has a problem with areas around the front of her face and it's been like that for a long time and when the fish vet was here a couple years ago she thought probably the high nitrate was the problem uh, a couple other people said they looked at the fish and they said well she's thick I say she, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, but let's just pretend it's a she. Um, doesn't look like this fish is malnourished, so maybe it's lacking a part of its diet. And so they told me, use way more nori for that fish. And so I've been doing the nori thing, but not all the time. I, I put it in like two, three times a week. But now the nitrates are 15. I'm very curious to see if that fish will heal the, the fleshy parts of his face and, and fill out and close up the little holes that are there so that she can look completely back to normal again. It's possible. These fish can heal. So we'll see what happens here in the, in the coming days or coming months. Could be years. Who knows? Um, other than that, I think that's it. I do want to remind you, even though I talked about water testing earlier, today's water test Saturday. That is our thing. I tell everyone on this channel every single week to test your water. And yet I read hundreds of comments from people saying, I haven't tested in forever. It's like, you're watching the video. What do you do, turn it off before I get to this part? Does my microphone go dead at that point? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. You gotta listen, be like me, Lev. Test your water. Even as you guys watch me with problems going on in my reef, how many of you ask me very specific numbers? You know, what about this, what about that? So you're asking me to test, you should be testing your water. I don't care if you're new to the hobby or you've been in the hobby 30 years, you still need to test your water. Caitlin said it best, water tests save lives. So we definitely wanna test our water, make sure that our parameters are where they belong. And if something's getting out of whack, make the correction. 
someone just last week posted how their numbers weren't right and they didn't know why and it turns out the tubing from their dosing pump had clogged shut and none of the fluid was getting in well if they were testing every single week they'd catch this number sooner they would find a problem with the tubing and correct it and uh, everything had been fine but instead they found it a little bit too late so it's really really important that you test your water make sure everything's operating correctly double check the things are dripping and flowing like they should and if you do all that then you should have a modicum of success as long as you have a, a little bit of luck as well other than that i hope you guys have a great weekend uh rogue gaming i keep saying rogue because it's got row in it rogue gaming says i'm testing my water right now lol and i'm glad you are good job so keep up the good work and I hope you guys have a great weekend, and I should see you next Saturday. Bye.